<laughs> I'm so glad to see um, so many of you back for day three of the Kenya One Health Conference. Um, we've had a great couple of days. We're going to do a, a full recap a little bit later on today. But so all I want to, to say today, right now, is that, you know, for those of you who were here yesterday, I hope that you came away really inspired about um, incorporating gender into your work and about how we're going to educate and, and train the next generation of One Health, health workers. So it was, it was a really um, inspirational day. Today, we're now really moving on um, into the policy space. So we've talked about research. We've talked about the concepts that we need to consider when we're doing One Health. Now we're really going to think about how do we get One Health into our policies and into the implementation on the ground. So this will be another exciting day. Really glad that we've got everybody um, here with us. Um, I've got a couple of just housekeeping reminders. So to those of you who are online, please make sure you mute your mics when you're joining. And for those of you who are joining us and participating with presentations online, make sure you switch on your video so that we can pin you. Um, Everybody who is online, your opinions, your thoughts are really, really valuable. Please use the chat function to let us know what you think, as well as interact with the Mentimeter. So we're going to be going to Menti next. So everybody remember the, the website, www.menti.com, and Nick will come in a moment and give you the code. Um, this session is being recorded, it's being live streamed, and by the end of the week, we will have the edited videos up on the website. They can already be found on YouTube under the ILRI YouTube site. Um, remember, all of you who are on um, social media, please join in the conversation. Um, tweet uh, using the hashtag KOHC2021 and follow us on Twitter. So with that, I would like to pass to Nicholas Ball for our first mentee of the day. Thank you very much, Dr. Lian, and welcome again, our online participants. So as usual, we'd love to gather your views on Menti. We have the code. We have the code 33551-9760. So our first question would be, we want to know any new knowledge that you've been gathering from the past two days what is changing? Are you still there since you, you joined or are there some evolving thoughts along? You know, somebody says one health is the way. Mm -hmm. Gender is one health, is a, is a core competency. Let's see, let's see. Yeah, we need gender inclusion. Yeah, somebody also is saying that we need social scientists on board, which is true. We need to mainstream gender. We need to include the environment. We need a framework for One Health implementation. Yeah, those are some of the thoughts that we'll be capturing today. Yeah, so keep them coming, keep them coming. How many responses so far? 20 seven, we can go up to 50. How many people do you have online? Three and then 315, yeah. So we are a tenth of, let's get to 50 or so. Yeah, collaboration is key, gender. Nobody's talking about One Health Education. <laughs> oh, we yeah, are good. I think we need more gender involvement. All right. Yeah, somebody says One Health is new to them. So I guess One Health Education is coming in. Uh, social component, that's true. Let's see. Yeah, all right. So keep them coming, keep them coming. We are at 55. So we can go to the next question. And now that we've learned about the issue of co collaboration, which discipline would you like to include? Maybe you've been working alone or in silos. Which discipline would you want to move on? Maybe one discipline that you'd love to include? 
which would be your ideal One Health. Oh, journalism, environmental scientists, social sciences, social sciences, animal health, gender, the Ministry of Women and Youth. Yeah, gender experts. Yeah, gender economists. Interesting. I hope you are not kicking kicking out the vets and the medics. <laughs> We're just including more. It is at this point then, after gathering the view, we'll still come back to Menti later on. It's now my joy and pleasure to welcome Dr. Victor Yamo, who will be taking us through the One Health policy and implementation. He'll be assisted by Dr. Martin Baraza, who will also be joining later there, co-chairing the session. So over to you, Dr. Victor Karibu. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, especially for the online uh, participants. I want to welcome you to this third day of the One uh, Kenya One Health Conference. And uh, today we'll be tackling One Health policy and implementation. And essentially how we want to do it is we'll start with the implementation bit where we'll have a series of presentations for about 90 minutes. And then we will have uh, some highlights on uh, what has transpired this far. And then we will have the policy session, which is going to be a high level uh, panel uh, constituted by various government officials, uh, FAO and USAID, some of our donors. And so without much ado, I'd like to start with the first presentation. Essentially what I will be requesting the presenters to do if you are here is to try and take about 10 minutes or max 12 minutes and then allow us opportunity to ask one or two questions. And uh, since I'm not conversant with all of them, what I'll do is when the presenter comes, they will quickly introduce themselves maybe in a minute and then make the presentation. So our first presentation will be on brucellosis control among agropastoralists in Tanzania, how to communicate risks effectively by Ms. Caroline Muhaki. So if Caroline is around, she can come. Or if yes, she's online, everyone. okay, all right. My name is Caroline Muhaki, and I'm going to be talking to you about brucellosis control among agropastoralists in Tanzania. My focus will be on how to communicate risk effectively. To begin with, brucellosis has been determined to be endemic in sub-Saharan Africa, and it is a high priority disease in Tanzania. So there are many efforts to control brucellosis in Tanzania. On the other hand, uh, brucellosis is the incidence of brucellosis is higher in pastoralist and agropastoralist context, and this is related to their consumption of raw animal source foods, as well as their, the way they handle their animals and the way they, they, they interact very closely with their livestock. And therefore, they have to be involved as key stakeholders in the control of brucellosis. On the other hand, there's the aspect of risk perception. What people make of a certain risk for disease, for example, in terms of its prevalence, in terms of its severity, in terms of how common that risk occurs, will determine the kind of preventive and control efforts they are willing to take or not willing to take up. And sometimes you might find that uh, the risk perception of professionals will be different from the risk perception of communities, and this will affect community sensitization and what, whether people are willing to take up those control strategies or not. The objective of this study, therefore, what the objectives of this study, therefore, were to identify the risk perceptions of the agro-pastoralist communities in relation to animal handling and consumption of raw animal products, as well as to determine the effective community engagement strategies. So first, we wanted to understand what their perceptions about animal source foods, raw animal source foods, as well as animal handling is concerned, and in terms of disease, in this case, brucellosis, and secondly, to identify what would be the best ways to communicate to them in a way that is likely to lead to long-term behavior change. 
This study was conducted in three villages in Kilombero district in Tanzania. These three villages neighbored each other. It was an ethnography, so I lived in this community for six months. And through these six months, I was able to conduct a survey with almost all the agropastoralist households in the three villages. And I was also able to do focus group discussions, in-depth interviews, key informant interviews, and also many informal interviews as well as a lot of observation. So I not only just heard from what they told me in the interviews, but also observed their actual behavior. And this study was conducted in 2019 between March and August. The results of this study show, first of all, that brucellosis is largely unknown. Many of the, the pastoralists and agropastoralists had never heard of brucellosis, and only 7.2% of them had ever heard of brucellosis in livestock. On the other hand, when we asked them whether they had observed symptoms of brucellosis in their animals, including abortions, retained placenta, infertility, stillbirths, many of some of them had actually observed those symptoms, but they did not consider them to be a big problem. First of all, this was related to the other livestock diseases in their context, which they felt were a much bigger priority than these other symptoms that they had witnessed of brucellosis. On the other hand, even when they observed the symptoms, they did not know what caused them. And sometimes they thought that some of them thought that they attributed them to supernatural factors. And this is because many of these symptoms were reproductive health challenges, which they compared to what happens in humans. So they said, even for humans, you will find stillbirths, you will find infertility. And so it was attributed to God, that God decides who gives birth, God decides which animals live and which ones die. So it wasn't really considered to be a big issue. When it comes to the issue of retained placenta, they had ways that they felt that they were able to extract the placenta, and so it wasn't really a, a difficult challenge for them. On the other hand, in this particular context, having owning a large herd of animals was more important than the individual productivity of each animal. So they were willing to retain animals that were not necessarily productive just to have a large herd and for sentimental value. For example, for infertile animals, they would say that those animals became very big and they were beautiful to look at. So for that reason, they were willing to retain them in the herd and maybe sell them at a much later date or slaughter them in the home when there was a function. So they still retain those kind of animals for other value, not necessarily monetary value, value or productive value. On the other hand, even for those who had heard about brucellosis or knew even brucellosis risk factors, they did not change their behavior. And they were willing to continue taking raw milk, consuming raw milk, or uh, assisting animals in parturition with bare hands, or handling aborted material with bare hands, because it wasn't really a big, it wasn't really a risk factor for disease. So they had heard about it, but they didn't believe that you can actually get sick from consuming raw milk, or from assisting your animal or staying very close to your animal. On, on the other hand, sensitization activities were usually conducted. So they said, for example, when they went to a health facility for women, a child welfare clinic, they would be told don't give raw milk to your child. Or when somebody had TB, they would be told do not take raw milk because that is how you get TB. But they did not feel that this kind of sensitization activities were actually addressing their questions, their doubts, and their uncertainties. So, for example, they would say, we know many people who do not take raw milk, but they are getting many diseases. Or we know some people who have never consumed raw milk or communities that don't take raw milk, but they are still getting TB. So they had those kind of questions which they felt that they never had, they didn't often have an opportunity to ask. Like when women went to the clinic, they were not able to ask these questions to nurses. Or when there was a community baraza, they were not able to ask these questions to the practitioners in a way that they felt that their questions were being responded to. And that was a big challenge for them in terms of adopting new practices or beginning to change their behavior, for example, beginning to boil milk. In this regard, therefore, we found that there was a disparity in the risk perception of professionals and that of the community. So for the professionals, they of course they already knew that consumption of raw animal source foods, residing with livestock, and many of these other risk factors was a big challenge in terms of controlling brucellosis. But for the community, they did not believe that those practices could actually make you sick from brucellosis or any other disease for that matter. And the reason is because these practices were rooted in, in tradition. This was their culture. It was actually part of who they are. 
and there were many other benefits that they attributed to these practices, especially to raw milk consumption. For example, they said raw milk is more nutritious. They said raw milk is more beneficial for children, especially when they are young, because of that nutritional value. They also said that raw milk helps to counteract any poisonous substances so that if you ingest anything that is not good for you then and take raw milk then it will counteract that action and you will be okay they also said that there were also practical reasons why that prevented them from boiling milk for example women said that they were overworked and so boiling milk was an extra chore that they were not willing to take up men said consuming raw milk when they're in the forest had looking after the animals is much more effective and more time saving so they do not want to go through that whole process of boiling milk and waiting for it to cool down before they can drink it and start their journey. On the other hand, there is a need for focus and long-term community engagement. So the way this kind of engagement was done, it was often done in a very haphazard manner. So it wasn't focused in the sense that it was not addressing the real issues in the community. And on the other hand, it was not targeting specific problems or specific questions that the communities had. On the other hand, this kind of engagement also was not long term. It was usually erratic, so once in a while. So like they would say, when we had a Rift Valley fever outbreak, they, we heard on the radio that you should not be taking raw milk. But it was not a long term kind of thing that would make them think about it and begin to, to, to process this information and to begin to question the kind of behavior that they were engaging in. So it wasn't in that case, therefore, they didn't feel that it was so effective in their context. In conclusion, therefore, these are the things that they propose. First of all, they felt that for community engagement to be very relevant and to be very um, accepted by them, it needs to be culturally sensitive. They felt that in many cases, people who came to communicate to them used a very patronizing attitude, or they did not understand their culture and they were not willing to listen to that this is part of who we are. So it, it, the way the message came across to them was not respectful and therefore they were not willing to listen to it. So like for women, they would say, when you go to a health facility and the nurses talk to us this way, we will just nod in agreement, but you're not planning to do, to change our behavior or to even consider what they are telling us. But if they were more culturally sensitive, like listening to us, trying to understand our rationale behind this behavior, then there might be dialogue and we might be more willing to listen to them. Secondly, they propose that this information needs to be targeted. It needs to be very targeted to their specific questions or specific doubts. So instead of this information being very general and broad, it needs to be specific. Like I said, there are questions that they have, and these are the questions they want answered. And so when professionals come to them, not just talking down to them and telling them you need to do this and stop doing that, but asking them, what is it about raw milk that you value? or why is it that you're having challenges with boiling milk, then that way they will be more willing to consider taking up those new behavior and taking up those new practices. On the other hand, it needs to be dynamic. The way it has been done in the past, it's usually like call a community baraza, in which case in this context, it is men who will attend. But they were proposing it needs to be dynamic so that you are involving children in schools. This education is being passed to children in schools. It's being passed to women, to herders, to men and that when it is so broadly done and when it is catering for many people then everybody will hear this message and maybe now the community can begin to examine it and to start thinking of a long-term behavior change even if they don't change now it can lead to long-term behavior change and lastly it needs to be continuous so that it's not just a one-off kind of thing but it needs to be done repeatedly over and over and over again because that when they, they said that the more they keep hearing this message, the more they are likely to consider it. But if they hear it once in a while, then to them it communicates that them, it's not really that important. But if they hear it more and more, like they gave the example of HIV, the way the, the messaging has been done, it's done so many times that people are now willing to consider it and to start thinking about it. And that is what they propose would eventually lead to long-term behavior change and that might start to help some of the brucellosis control strategies that are being employed in this particular context. Because even if we were to start doing vaccination or anything else like that, the community still needs to own it and to still accept this kind of control. Lastly, these are the two publications so far from this work and you can look at them and they would give further insights. 
And lastly, I want to acknowledge the following individuals for supporting this study. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Yeah, thank you very much, Caro, uh, for keeping time and also for a very interesting and engaging uh, presentation. Uh, for me, it was very interesting to see the footer of your slides that said uh, involve communities, information is not enough. And I think you've uh, uh, highlighted the facts that we need to be looking at when we are engaging communities and how it needs to be done, being cultural sensitive at certain levels, ensuring that we are not condescending or looking down on them, but addressing the real and felt issues. Uh, they are, for those of us who are online, kindly send your questions on the chat box so that we can ask. As uh, I looked at it, there was none. So I'd like to propose that we move to the next presentation that will be done by Dr. Donald Otieno on foodborne disease outbreak in Kericho County. Karibu Daktari, and try to match Caroline's uh, 15, 12 minutes presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Donald Otieno. I work from the government. I work uh, as a veterinarian in the county government of Kericho and also an aff affiliate of uh, the Kenya Field Epidemiology and Laboratory Training Unit, training unit, uh, intermediate class of 2018. My presentation today is about foodborne disease outbreak in Kericho County. Background globally, foodborne diseases are an important cause of illness and death among, among human populations. And they also impair on socioeconomic development of the entire population. As we speak now, there's no sufficient data or information to actually put a quantity figure on the global burden due to foodborne disease outbreaks. Bacteria is uh, said to be responsible for almost two thirds of human foodborne disease outbreaks worldwide. Annually, the CDC has estimated that foodborne disease diseases are responsible for 76 million human illnesses, 25,000 hospitalizations, and 5,000 deaths in the USA. In Kenya, he said that under reporting inadequate investigation of disease outbreaks and inadequate diagnostic facilities suggest that foodborne diseases are more than what's recorded by the Minister of Health. Uh, in this presentation, I would try to relay the findings about a foodborne disease outbreak investigation, and also how interdisciplinary partnership played along to bring out this investigation into perspective. On Monday of the 23rd, August 2021, the country disease surveillance and response team notified by the hospital clinician that there were 35 patients who had been reported to the hospital with symptoms of diarrhea, vomiting, and headache. A total of 35 patients. A total of 35 patients uh, were admitted with these symptoms, and later on, in the course of the day, a 38-year-old maid passed away. Five patients were immediately admitted. Uh, 29 were treated at the casualty and uh, released to go home. On the same evening, the story was carried on the national media, and now it was a, a big news. The following day, that is on 24th. On Tuesday, the Department of Health constituted an interdisciplinary team that was having a task of establishing the existence of a possible outbreak of a zoonotic foodborne disease. And the team was, was given a mandate to go to the ground and establish existence of a foodborne disease outbreak and also come with ways of managing it, bring it under control. When the team went to the ground, we found from the key informants that a sick goat had been slaughtered in that village uh, on Friday and the meat was sold out locally and people ate it. On further questions, we found that the goat was sick previously, maybe on Tuesday. The owner sold it to a butcher. Then the butcher stayed with it on Wednesday and brought it back to the owner because he realized that the goat was sick at number signs, was bloated and had funny behavior. So he brought back the goat then on Friday. That's when the owner slaughtered it to recover his cost. So the team that went to the ground to do 
to establish disease, if there was a disease outbreak and find out reasons as to why, had uh, the following composition. We had the uh, human clinical and laboratory staff, public health team, veterinary public health and place of disease surveillance, and also people from the regional veterinary investigation laboratory in Kericho. Also in the team, we had the community health workers, as well as uh, the Mijikumi and the provision on the, the national administration. The main objective of this team was just to describe the foodborne disease outbreak in, a, in, in, in person, place, and time, and also characterize the risk factors that resulted to, to, to people getting in contact with the unsafe food. So this study was done in Soliat Ward, that's in Soin Siguet sub-county of Kecho County. It lasted from the 23rd when the outbreak was detected up to the 31st when symptoms had resolved. Then uh, we did a retrospective called Dreaming Costagi. So we had a case definition because we are doing a line list of people who are exposed. So we were line listing anybody or any person of any age who ate the goat that was slaughtered on Friday on the 20th of August 2021 at, at the same village, at the same ward, Soliat ward. Then uh, we commenced to do uh, an active case search the following day. We did a, st a structured questionnaire that was uh, multidisciplinary supported. Also, we had a knowledge, attitude, and practice equations in it so that we could get prongs into all areas where we could uh, generate data. So, Sociodemographic variables, clinical and exposure factors were considered. After that, there were samples that were considered for laboratory analysis. There were human samples that were collected in the hospital. And also the RVIL Kericho uh, went ahead and took the environmental samples and screened a few animals within the homesteads. The samples were, the human samples were uh, analyzed using standard culture and molecular typing for pathogenic, pathogenic enterics. This was done at the Walter Reed uh, Human Laboratory Diagnostics in Kericho. Data was collected by trained enumerators. We got a training. Enumerators, this was must be disciplinary. It was one setting, and that was entered and cleaned in Microsoft Office Excel. Uh, continuous data was analyzed by measures of central tendency and dispersion. We reported them as mean and median. This data was uh, analyzed by frequency of counts and proportions and presented in tables and graphs. Where we analyze like, for hypotheses, we calculate the relative risks. Uh, that's uh, in uh, areas where the, the risk factors are epi epidemiological significance. Results. In the descriptive findings, a total of three cases were like, listed actively on the ground during the case search. The median age was 27 years. 29 of them were female, that was 54.7%. Then we find that the median incubation period of the disease had a uh, it was 15 hours. A total of 58% of symptomatic cases sought medical care within 24 hours of onset of clinical signs. And symptoms resolution period had a median of 5.5 days. So it means the convalescence period was around one week. The table below shows the proportion of foodborne disease morbidity characterized in terms of age and sex. If you look at the between age six and 15, those are children that bore the brunt of this uh, foodborne disease outbreak. And uh, most of them were young children of female gender. Okay, uh, when we describe, uh, we describe symptoms among the outbreak cases so that we could know which ones were more predominant, of the 53 cases that we like listed, 24 of them came down with the clinical disease. And these were the, the predominant symptoms that they complained about. Headache was number one at 87%, followed by the fever, 79, abdominal pains, diarrhea, nausea, fatigue, and vomiting. So these ones, we saw them as quite characteristics of a, a foodborne, a bacterial foodborne disease outbreak that we are going to describe here. Then we did a bivalent analysis. We, conducted a hypothesis testing. A lot of it 
And now we found significant uh, relationship on these independent variables. We found that in terms of gender and the residence of a particular village called Kipselton where the animal was slaughtered, this particular group had a higher relative risk of developing disease. So we thought it's a group problem and maybe the particular behavior of these groups could have predisposed them to a risky public health behavior. That is gender in terms of the male were more at risk in developing disease than female and also the rest is of that particular village. I think uh, their consumption and the uh, utilization of the, the meat in greater quantities could have come to that end. Then we analyzed those who eat the roast meat, the method of cooking, category of yes or, or no, because they were eating roast, roasted, some ate it raw, some ate it uh, boiled. So those who ate it roasted were more likely to develop disease than the other methods of cooking. Then eating tripes, that is the so-called matumbo, they were more at higher risk of coming down with the disease. So laboratory results from human samples went as follows. Eh? We isolated five pathogenic microorganisms of which two were stereotypes of E. coli and one was salmonella as shown in the table above. So in the toxigenic E. coli, we had two isolates. Sugar toxin producing E. coli, we had two isolates. Enteroagregative E. coli, we had two isolates. Salmonella two, and enteropathogenic E. coli, there was one isolate. So it seems like there was a mixed, like kind of infection of pathogenic bacteria in this population. Discussion. After analyzing the data presented before us, we could say that this disease was an outbreak of a bacterial zoonosis disease caused by pathogenic E. coli and salmonella organisms in primary transmission because people ate it directly. There was no, no vehicle involved. Then progression of clinical symptoms, as we described them, like incubation periods of 15, of a medium of 15 hours, convalescence period lasting for almost a week, 5.5 days in the median, and the presenting clinical signs of headache, fever, diarrhea, and stomach aches, these are now consistent with the isolates that were confirmed in the laboratory from the human samples. Then children are the greatest, but the greatest burden of clinical disease. We perceived it may be due to the low immunity or lack of exposure to such kind of pathogenic organisms. Males and the residents of that particular village, we perceived that they were a high risk group, maybe due to a behavior that could put them to a public health risk. I don't know whether this is gender, like it was discussed yesterday, that males tend to behave in a particular manner that could endanger them or make them risky to succumb to disease. Like a, in this community, it is a agro-pastoral community. And people believe that maybe getting a, eating raw parts of a goat is more traditional or more healthier than eating the cooked ones. Because was this, the old guys tend to, to get some organs and eat them raw fast is when the women can go and cook. So we thought that is a risky behavior that was being practiced by a particular group of these populations. Then people having eat, eaten the roasted meat, the tribes, that's the matumbo, or a high disease risk due to, if you look at the kind of cooking, maybe for the roast meat, there's insufficient heat penetration and also there's a lot of handling so that if there was a contamination, it could easily be passed from a person to the food and to the consumer who is likely more to get ill. And also the tribes, we perceive them to be, to have had a high dose of the, of the pathogens because uh, these, the pathogens, the E. coli and the Salmonera and most of them are enterics and they are found uh, as normal flora within the, the, the fecal material of, of animals. Then we found that health seeking duration was very short. That is the, within 12, 24, 24 hours of development of clinical science. So we could say that this was due to the severity of this foodborne disease outbreak because the uh, health seeking pattern of most people in the society 
People tend to stay with the disease waiting resolution before they seek medical help. But all, uh, these ones, everybody just all of a sudden sought medical intervention. Then the limitations to our study was that uh, there was an availability of samples from the social animals so that we could take it also for bacteriology. The slaughtered animals, we could not get even the fecal material, even the hides, the skins, even the bones. Everything was not there. I think uh, this one we attributed to maybe there was a kind of a destruction of evidence because people are now apprehensive. A person had died in this village. The person who slaughtered the animal is a pastor and also has got a lot of influence. Then he was also under arrest by the police. By the time we were going there, he was already arrested. So we thought that the, the villagers were now trying to conceal uh, so that we don't break through with any investigation that could put him at the center of this whole thing. So that was a limitation. We could not directly link the animal slaughtered the food to the pathogens found or isolated within the human population. So what are the public health actions and the importance of the disciplinary team response that we played? From 23rd, when the case, the first cases, the outbreak was detected, and the disciplinary team was constituted. That was a veterinary, public health, medical, laboratory, and all of us. We came together and we played a, a very pivotal role in the detection of the disease outbreak, verification of diagnosis and confirmation of disease in the, in the laboratory. The case definition, we worked on it as a, as a team. We designed and structured questionnaires. This also included the knowledge attitude and practice about animal health, about public health, and health-seeking behavior of people in the population. So it was a, a very big study. Some of the findings we've not reported here. So we also did a tabulation and orientation of data in time, place, and person so that we could describe uh, actually what was going on. Then there was formulation and test of hypothesis. This one, we did it because the interdisciplinary approach was very important, like uh, in case of epidemiologic uh, consultation. The medical side was uh, the one that was leading this team, but now the veterinary side also came in to bring out epidemic information that could help develop hypotheses, actually to determine risk factors that could have led to the development of the foodborne disease outbreak. Then uh, as a team, we, we conducted the implementation of control measures and then we communicated and disseminated the findings about the foodborne disease outbreak. In conclusion, I can say that the food board disease outbreak was caused by pathogenic E. coli and salmonella bacteria. And this was rapidly managed, showing the importance of having a coordinated county to display the one health team. Public health risks, behaviors in gender and geographical defined groups, increased food handling, inadequate cooking time, played a major role in the food borne disease outbreak. Then we can say that children bore the greatest health burden of the food borne disease outbreak. outbreak. In a recommendation, we are recommending continuous public health education on food hygiene practices and change of attitudes regarding public health risk behaviors. This may be attributed to particular groups, like uh, men or particular groups in the village. Then uh, we also recommend that there should be anchoring the county one health interdisciplinary teams on disease control policy in each and every county so that uh, thereby giving it a formal institutional platform for efficient communication, coordination, and leadership. Because without leadership, an interdisciplinary team cannot work harmoniously, like uh, the one we did, because we did not have a formal platform to carry out this work. I want to acknowledge the county government of Kericho, Department of Health, led by our epidemiologist, Dr. Kigen Tabu. He coordinated this work. Our director of veterinary services, Dr. Kirui. I also want to thank Walter Reed Project, Medical Research Institute in Garicho for having done the laboratory work. Isolation and, character, and the characterizations of the various isolates, the molecular work. Then we also want to thank the RVL Garicho because they try to do, look at the environmental samples to screen some animals with this same population and to, to see the, the spread of the pathogenic organisms in the environment. And uh, least one, uh, last but not least, the Kenya World Health Conference for having uh, given us this platform to further disseminate this information to the general populace. 
So those are some of my references. In picture form, this is a, we are doing key informant interview at Sonia Ward, the special grounds. And this is the RVL team. They're trying to pick some environmental samples for laboratory work. I say thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ari. There are several questions that have come through from uh, the chat. I can see Dr. Kisiru has tried to help you uh, address some of them. Uh, but if you can, just go through the chat and uh, address those questions because we are pressed for time. I think the important thing is the fact that you have elucidated that uh, anchoring the county one health teams in the county is critical and important. And I think it's a discussion that we'll be having with the panelists uh, at the policy level uh, when Dr. Baraza will be leading. And so without much ado, I would like to welcome the next presenter, uh, Dr. Christian Odinga, who's going to be talking about assessing the importance of rabies vaccination campaigns in influencing community knowledge and prevention of rabies in Laikipia, Kenya. Aribu Daktari. Uh, thank you so much. My name is uh, Christian Odinga, and uh, currently I'm undertaking my master's in uh, veterinary epidemiology and economics at the University of Nairobi. Uh, so today I'm here to present to you on some work that we did as part of my MSc, that is uh, to assess the importance of a uh, rabies vaccination campaign uh, at influencing community knowledge and prevention of this uh, disease. Uh, rabies is a disease that affects both animals and humans. It has a domestic cycle and also a wild cycle. Uh, in, the in the domestic cycle, the dog has been cited as the major source of infection in humans. But then uh, the wild cycle is equally important because uh, studies have shown that uh, the disease uh, has a, a potential of wiping out entire population, such as the African wild dog, with a detrimental effect to the ecosystem. And so currently, uh, 59,000 people die uh, of rabies uh, in the world every year. And this is because of uh, poor surveillance uh, and also limited resources allocated for the control and prevention of this disease. And uh, due to that, the World Health Organization uh, set a target to eliminate uh, human rabies uh, by the year 2030. And these have seen increased collaborations across health sectors and uh, the number of uh, rabies vaccination campaigns have also increased. Uh, in Kenya, uh, it uh, accounts for about uh, 2000 deaths per year. And uh, I can say we are not in a bad place because uh, under the stewardship of the Zoonotic Disease Unit, we have a strategy to eliminate this disease uh, uh, as per the World Health Organization uh, target. And uh, mass dog vaccination is the main uh, part of this uh, among other preventive uh, efforts. Uh, so uh, why Lykipia? Uh, in Lykipia, we have the Lykipia Rabies Vaccination Campaign, uh, which was uh, started in uh, 2015 by the gentleman on the right uh, of your slide. Uh, they've done this work, actually, they started it to increase uh, vaccination coverage in uh, pastoral and uh, smallholder settlements that uh, dominate that region. Uh, and also, they also have uh, limited access to veterinary services. Uh, there's a photo of their, their paper that they developed from their work. If you want to know more about what they've done, you can look into it. Uh, but then the map uh, just below uh, shows uh, the, the polygons represents the communities that have been visited. Uh, since this uh, vaccination campaign was started in 2015. And uh, I'd just like to point out that the northern part, uh, Ilmosio Kandolul, uh, is predominantly made of uh, pastoral communities, while the southern parts uh, are made of uh, agro-pastoral settlements. So our objective for this uh, study was to evaluate the impact of this vaccination campaign towards uh, I mean, improving community knowledge and also prevention practices on rabies. So how did you go about it? Uh, we conducted a cross-sectional survey uh, for six months. We visited households in this uh, in Laikipia region, uh, as shown on the map uh, below. Uh, those are the polygons represent the communities that have been visited by the vaccination campaign that we are assessing. And also on the light, right, there's a region where they have never visited. So we also conducted a survey in that uh, community. And, uh, the right part of, my, part of my slide shows some of the questions that we were ask, asking them uh, uh, on a mobile-based device 
provided by the Worldwide Veterinary Service and uh, deposited to a common database. The image is just me conducting one of the questionnaires to a respondent. Uh, we were interested in uh, three variables. Uh, that is the knowledge about the disease, the practices around it, and also the dog vaccination status. And uh, for this, we scored the rabies knowledge based on a number of questions as shown on the block on the right side, mainly, mainly transmission of the disease and the species affected. But we also teased out the practices of these communities around, around this disease based on the questions shown on the, on the lower part. That is the health seeking behavior for humans and also if they wash their wounds after dog bites. One of our key predictor variable, among others, was our vaccination years. That is the years that, the, that this uh, vaccination campaign covered in these communities that we visited. And we, we found that uh, uh, the, range of, uh, I mean, the range of years that uh, these communities have been visited by this vaccination campaign was uh, from zero to six years with an average of uh, five years. Uh, the demographics of our participants was that 59% uh, of them were female, 26% uh, of them had no formal education, while 34% uh, had, studied, had studied from a secondary level and beyond. And their ages ranged from 13 years to 83 years with an average of uh, 35 years of age. <clears throat> what did we find? Uh, we found that 60% uh, of our respondents uh, scored uh, or were considered to have inadequate knowledge about uh, this disease. And this was based on an aggregate score uh, on the questions like uh, how is uh, rabies transmitted, uh, uh, the typical signs, and also whether it's fatal or not. So 75% of our respondents will be able to identify that this disease is fatal. 69% uh, identified at least one typical sign in dogs. Uh, we were focusing on uh, nervous signs, uh, change of behavior, bites, hypersalivation. And 54% uh, of our respondents uh, stated that they knew this disease is transmitted via animal bites. Uh, on asking about uh, the species that can be affected, uh, the ones that knew that uh, this disease can affect both humans and uh, animals were 37%. 24% of uh, our respondents that had adequate knowledge about this disease could identify the dog as the main reservoir, and 2.3% could identify other mammals that can be infected by this disease. And so on further going deep into this analysis, we found that uh, the number of years uh, visited by this vaccination campaign was not significantly associated with uh, or did not influence uh, knowledge about rabies. But then education of the dog owners actually influenced uh, knowledge about rabies as shown on the, uh, on the plot there that shows that represents the odds, odds, odds ratios. Uh, the main source of information about rabies uh, as per our respondents, was uh, informal word of mouth, either hearing about rabies from their neighbors or friends, or uh, uh, just uh, any person that they meet. Uh, while uh, vaccination effort, mainly the Laikipia rabies vaccination campaign, accounted for 5% uh, as the source of information. And it's also important to note that uh, about 17%, which is a good uh, number, did not know about rabies at all. Uh, on further looking into the sources of, of information, we found that uh, respondents who knew about this disease uh, through informal word of mouth uh, actually uh, scored, uh, was scored to have uh, inadequate knowledge about rabies. But then, uh, uh, just to note, uh, sources such as school and books provided adequate knowledge about this disease based on our aggregate score. On looking at the dog vaccination status, which was the main aim of this uh, vaccination campaign, 63% of our respondents had their dogs vaccinated against uh, rabies. But then 87% uh, of the respondents that had their dogs vaccinated were, uh, were up to date with their vaccination. That is, uh, they, have, they had vaccinated their dogs uh, not more than one year before we conducted our study. And uh, again, uh, there was no uh, significant uh, association between uh, the number of years covered by the vaccination campaign and uh, the probability of the owners uh, to vaccinate their dogs. Or the, there was no influence in the number of years to dog vaccination by the owners. But then uh, on the other hand, owner education and uh, knowledge about rabies actually influenced the vaccination status. Uh, when we looked at uh, some of the reasons, and this is just a uh, preliminary because uh, when we looked at some of the reasons that uh, uh, the, owner, the dog owners presented for not vaccinating their dogs. Eh? 
Uh, Fourteen percent of the respondents say that uh, they did not believe their dogs needed to be vaccinated. Uh, also, it's important to note that uh, a good percentage uh, say that they didn't know that their dogs should be vaccinated, and uh, another good percentage did not know where to get the vaccines for rabies for their dogs. Uh, looking at uh, health-seeking behavior, 95% uh, of our respondents uh, say that they will visit the hospital after a dog bite. But then we all know that it's not enough to visit the hospital. There are other uh, practices that determine the outcome of a dog bite. So for example, we have practices such as uh, wound hygiene, uh, urgency of going to the hospital, and also knowing that you need to get uh, uh, vaccinated or post-exposure treatment. Uh, and 4% of our respondents that uh, say they will go to the hospital uh, stated that they will practice wound hygiene. 5% showed urgency in going to the hospital by using terms such as going there immediately uh, before 24 hours elapses or the same, the same day. And 2% uh, of them knew exactly what they were going to get in the hospitals, that is anti-rabies vaccine. Uh, so what can we conclude so far from what we have? Uh, the number of vaccination years huh, uh, by this vaccination campaign is not as, was not a significant predictor of rabies knowledge and dog vaccination. But then uh, education of the dog owners was, and uh, we can also say that uh, more efforts are needed to improve on uh, the human health seeking behavior uh, as a, a, a key practice in uh, preventing human rabies. So what are our recommendations? Uh, we recommend that uh, the Lakeipia rabies vaccination campaign should incorporate more education efforts uh, in, in tandem with the, their vaccination. And uh, they can do this by involving local elders during the planning process so that uh, people know, you know, conducting focus group discussions to educate the locals about the importance of vaccinating their dogs so that they don't just bring their dogs huh, to have them vaccinated for free while they don't know the importance of having their dogs vaccinated. And this uh, has been shown by a previous experience where we had uh, a canine distemper outbreak just after the 2017 vaccination, which led to uh, a detrimental effect. I mean, the communities were again uh, doubting the relevance of vaccinating their dogs. The other recommendation is that uh, the vaccination campaign needs to train uh, local representatives so that they can act as a quick response team to constantly monitor the situation of uh, this disease and also other welfare uh, practices in the dogs and the humans. So what are the next steps? Uh, we plan to educate uh, uh, the communities uh, by conducting, uh, you know, educating local representatives and also looking at, uh, if uh, looking at the, the the ethnic differences so that we can determine if we need to carry out more education efforts in uh, other communities compared to others. And also we plan to estimate the burden of uh, rabies by conducting uh, in intensive bite care management. And all these uh, steps will be working towards uh, improving the One Health uh, aspects of uh, this vaccination campaign. As uh, I can quote Henry Ford, uh, if everyone else is moving to forward together, then success takes care of itself. Uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge all the study participants, uh, Andrew Lesurmat, who was my field assistant and my university supervisors, and also all the other organizations that made this work possible in one way or the other. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Ari, for keeping it short and brief and to the point. There are several questions that are coming through which you might need to look at uh, the chat and uh, discuss or respond to. But the interesting ones, which I think I'd like to throw out there is a question by AU. I don't know whether that's African Union, but they call themselves AU. Is elimination of rabies achievable? I think something that we need to be thinking through. Uh, one from a good friend of mine says, dealing with stray dogs, do we need a dog protection policy? Well, and then maybe for Dr. Uh, Christian, did you use any, was there any use of local language? That's one. And then which other species, Dr. Gakuya of KWS is asking, which other species or animals were affected or did you look at? Maybe you can answer those two, then you can proceed to the next one. Uh, so first I'll ask, I'll answer the question. The first one was about, sorry. The first one was, uh, do you want to deal with is elimination of uh, rabies achievable? Uh, I can say 
elimination of human rabies is achievable. Okay. Then the second one and, is- And that is based on the, the current okay. trajectory. Okay. Yeah, but then also for, for the other cycles, it's also achievable. All right. If we can uh, do a good vaccination coverage. Okay. So it's about policy and implementing it, because the strategies in place, it's just ensuring the right actors are put in place and drives that process for us. Uh, yes. Okay. Then the, the last two, which are critical and important, is in your discussion, you one of the things you said is use of local representatives. Yes. Somebody asked us whether the, the the engagement was in local language or it was in English or the international the other languages. And then Gakuya wants to know whether there were any other species of animals affected by the rabies other than dogs. Yes. So first of all, about uh, the language, we had a field assistant who is a local, and uh, he assisted in translating the questionnaires and also formulating the questionnaires. Right. We did it together. Okay. And then about uh, other species, I can say we have, uh, I mean, uh, what we've uh, seen from literature is that uh, rabies has uh, been incriminated in almost wiping out the entire African wild dog population mm -hmm. in certain settings. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you, Dr. Ari. I think you can engage the rest on uh, the uh, chat box. I want to, and uh, my good friend Baraza will be picking up whether we need to have a dog protection policy or whether it's something that uh, we can look at at another level. I want to move us on to the next presenter, which will be done by pre-recorded video by uh, doc, uh, Dr. Valentine, Valentina Ndolo. Uh, the topic is spatial predictive model of anthrax across Kenya using a Bayesian approach. So over to the team for the video. Hello, everyone. My name is Valentina Ndolo. I'm a PhD student from the University of Cambridge, studying at the Department of Veterinary Medicine. And today I'm going to present to you a spatial predictive model of anthrax disease across Kenya using a Bayesian approach implemented by our INLA. So to begin with, anthrax is a zoonotic disease caused by bacillus anthracis. And prior to infection, the bacteria exists in the form of dominant spores in the soil that are resistant to extreme environmental pressure often surviving for decades and contributing to the persistence of anthrax outbreaks. Now, animals can get anthrax when they graze on contaminated soils. And upon ingestion of the spores, they change into the vegetative form, multiply within the host and cause disease, or sometimes death in susceptible animals. Humans can get anthrax from direct contact with infected animals. They exhibit four forms of the disease, cutaneous form, gastrointestinal form, and the inhalational form. A fourth and rare form of human disease, injection anthrax, was recently added to account for the infections observed among heroin drive users. Now, anthrax causes environmental contamination, massive economic losses in the agricultural sector, and it's also a public health burden in several countries and threatens biodiversity. Although anthrax cases have been documented globally, Africa has been reported to have the highest prevalence of anthrax disease in livestock. Now, anthrax remains a huge burden in Kenya, with a sharp increase in cases reported from the year 2005, and this could most likely be due to improved surveillance following the inception of frameworks such as the Zoonotic Diseases Unit in Kenya. Now, some of the ecological drivers of anthrax are well known and they include precipitation, temperature, soil, amongst others. And although these drivers have been used to model the geographic extent of anthrax risk, recent studies have applied classical algorithms that cannot capture the underlying spatial dependencies observed in the anthrax surveillance data. Here, we apply a Bayesian approach to analyze a long-term spatial data set spanning 30 years of livestock anthrax case data to investigate the drivers of the geographical distribution of anthrax risk across Kenya. We recorded 582 cases of livestock anthrax from 1991 to 2020, and we obtained this data from the Kenya Directorate of Veterinary Services in Nairobi, 
and five regional veterinary investigation laboratories in Karatina, Nakuru, Eldoret, Kericho, and Mariakani. We also recorded 20 wildlife outbreaks from the Kenya Wildlife Service, and these cases were confirmed through clinical and laboratory diagnosis. Statistical analysis was done using R in La package, which stands for Integrated Nested Laplace Approximation. The map on the extreme left shows the livestock cases in red and the wildlife cases in yellow. And what we did was for the livestock cases, we designed a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer grid cell structure as shown in the middle and calculated the number of anthrax cases within each grid cell. So in the end, we had a total of 184 grid cells measuring 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer with at least one case of anthrax within each cell after grouping all the 582 case locations. So the image on the right is showing an example of this where you have several cases, group them into grid cells, and then you obtain the centroid coordinate of each grid cell, which now represents the number of case counts per location. So these were our new presence locations. We used a zero truncated Poisson likelihood to model the counts of anthrax outbreaks per location because we only had presence data without zeros. The equation for the model is as shown above, where CI represents the anthrax case counts per location. So these are the 184 grid cells which had at least one anthrax case. The ECI represents the posterior mean or the expected values. Alpha here is the intercept. X is a matrix of the covariates. Betas here represent the linear coefficients, while the delta K represents the nonlinear effects. And the U represents the spatial random effects. And these spatial random effects were obtained using a mesh as shown on the on the right and this mesh was used to calculate the spatial random field and the effects were then added to the model. The covariates used were bio2 mean dinner temperature range, bio18 precipitation of the warmest quarter, elevation distance to water, soil calcium and soil water. The images above are showing the results of the model. The gray graphs on the right are showing the non-linear effects of four covariates, bio-18 and bio-2 on top, and soil calcium and soil water below. These were obtained using cubic regression splines with five knots. The red error bars on the right are showing the intercept on top, the fixed effect for elevation in the middle, and the fixed effect for distance to water in the bottom. The results of the Bayesian model showed that Distance to water bodies was significantly associated with a reduced incidence of anthrax outbreaks. Past studies have demonstrated a significant negative link between distance to water bodies and the suitability of an area for the occurrence of anthrax. This is most likely linked to the fact that most animals use communal watering points. Thus, there's an increased likelihood of observing anthrax outbreaks close to water bodies than further away. Elevation had a positive effect on the incidence of anthrax outbreaks. The remaining four variables had nonlinear effects. Possibly better explained by looking at the effect on the fitted values. The graph on the right shows the covariate values against the fitted values. The table on the left shows the DIC values of the full model and the various versions of the models where a single covariate was removed each time. We also calculated the difference in DIC between the full model and the models missing various covariates. The mean dinner temperature range bio2 had the strongest effect on the model and removing it increased the DIC by a magnitude of 83. Bio18, precipitation of the warmest quarter also had a strong effect. And the incidence of anthrax cases increased with increasing precipitation up to about 400 mils, then reduced. Soil calcium also had a positive effect on anthrax incidence initially, but this effect wore off as the values increased beyond 10. And soil water had mostly a negative effect on the incidence of anthrax.
These are the results of the spatial random field showing the spatially correlated random effects. And these were added to the final model to calculate the fitted values. The maps above show the mean predicted anthrax risk in the middle and the lower credible interval on the left and the upper credible interval on the right. Blue areas are those with lower risk while the warmer colors moving towards red are those with increasing risk. The model prediction showed that most parts of central, western, and coastal Kenya were at risk of anthrax. However, the small pockets of anthrax risk areas in the northern parts of the country, specifically in Turkana County, were alarming. Now, Turkana is classified as an arid and semi-arid land with mostly pastoralist communities who rely on mobility to get access to water and grazing resources. These pastoralists are often economically and politically marginalized, lacking access to both veterinary and public health services usually available to the rest of the population. As such, they are at greater risk of zoonotic diseases like anthrax, and the sparsity of recorded outbreaks in this region could reflect the limited surveillance practices and not necessarily the absence of livestock cases. Thus, more effort could be put in place to improve anthrax surveillance across this region. By accounting for spatial dynamics, we demonstrate an approach that is easy to interpret and replicate for other diseases. And this approach is particularly useful for studies that have patchy surveillance data and underlying structural dependencies. This risk model can support the planning of surveillance and prevention campaigns, particularly in marginalized pastoralist communities, which are disproportionately affected. With that, I would like to acknowledge the following, my supervisors, the Gates Cambridge Trust, the Royal Geographical Society, and the Kenya One Health Online Conference for organizing this amazing event. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can give her a clap. And I'm not sure whether we can take questions, but uh, I can see there was a question asking why there are no cases of anthrax in Northern Kenya. Baraza, you want to say something? Because I saw you trying to answer. Yes, I think I know. <laughs> yeah, she did make a reference to precipitation as a factor and Northern yeah. Kenya being usually very dry most of the time, that can be an explanation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think without much ado, I'd like to welcome the next presenter, uh, which will be Dr. Augusta Kivunzia, who will be talking about National Strategy for Prevention and Control of Anthrax in Humans and Animals in Kenya. And I think it then links to the next session, which is about policy. And so maybe an opportunity to highlight what you're trying to do in terms of strategy and policy. Karibu, Dr. Good afternoon, my name is Augusta Kivunzia. I work for the county government of Kitui. And um, today I'm presenting, I'm presenting national strategy for prevention and control of anthrax in humans and animals in Kenya, 2021 to 2036. And um, bring this on behalf of zoonotic disease unit. Uh, anthrax is a zoonotic disease caused by Bacillus anthracis, it's a bacterial disease. And in Kenya, it is ranked the topmost zoonotic disease. This is based on systematic analysis of the burden of the disease, socioeconomic impact, severity of the disease, and the potential to cause outbreak. Based on uh, records review from the veterinary department and public health from the national level, it has indicated that uh, more than 10 outbreaks occur every year in Kenya with a spillover to human to human. And this data is based on surve passive surveillance. However, it is considered to be underestimating the outbreaks because of this uh, nature of surveillance. Some of the outbreaks may go unreported or they are detected very late. Lack of one health strategy for control of anthrax has been noted in a number of uh, reports. The OIE Performance Veterinary Service Report 2018 and the WHO Joint External Evaluation 2017 have, been, have noted 
the lack of one health strategy in control of anthrax. And therefore, recommendation were meant to develop and implement one health to implement anthrax strategy. The objective of this strategy is to eliminate human anthrax and reduce the incidence of anthrax in animals to less than 1% of the baseline of 2021 by the year 2036. This strategy was uh, developed through a consultative meeting, drawing uh, stakeholders from the academia, from the relevant ministries, and from non-governmental organization. A series of meetings were held, drafts were developed, were reviewed, and uh, validated through workshops. The strategy is based on uh, guiding principles that anthrax prevention and control requires a multisectoral and multidisciplinary collaborative approach. And effectively, it ev effectively reduces the negative impact on public health and national economy. And it involves breaking the cycle of infection and that community is key in the prevention and control of anthrax. Uh, committee, coordination committees will be developed at the national level, at the sub-county level, and the county levels. And these committees will involve various stakeholders from the government ministries, from the county government, the national government, it will also involve professional bodies such as KVA and KMA, farmers and community-based organization. Mm -hmm. Other stakeholders will involved will be the regional and the national stakeholders. And all these will work to guided by certain thematic area as we discuss as we go on. The anthrax and prevention control strategy will have seven pillars on which uh, its implementation will be based. One, coordination, collaboration, and partnership. And the objective of this is to enhance collaboration between ministries and other partners and NGOs to ensure that anthrax is well prevented and controlled. Two is surveillance reporting systems and outbreak response. During implementation of this strategy, the existing surveillance system will be enhanced is to ensure that we receive timely reporting of outbreaks and also responds to any outbreak before it spills to the humans. Third will be prevention and control of anthrax. This is both in animals, wildlife, and in humans. The objective will be to ensure that vaccines for vac vaccines are available, quality vaccines, that are available and affordable to the communities. And also that guidelines on ensuring that uh, any cases confirmed of anthrax are well handled to prevent con contamination of the environment and also infection of humans. Resource mobilization, this will be done uh, through advocacy, holding meetings, seeking to get funds which will be very key in implementation and control of this strategy. Re-communication will be key. And the main objective is to increase awareness across the communities, which will be very important while controlling anthrax. Six will be conduct, promote operational and applied research. These uh, studies will be very important as they will help us to get data and inform on the progress on the implementation of this strategy. Then the seventh one will be anthrax diagnostics, laboratory capacity. The objective of this pillar is to ensure that the capacity of the laboratories, both the regional and national, they were announced such that they can confirm any anthrax cases, as well as promote networking of labs, both in the human and the public, such that they can share information on anthrax. The implementation 
of Andrax elimination strategy will follow four phases. These phases will systematically eliminate or reduce the cases in, human, in animals, aiming at elimination of the disease in humans. And in each phase, we'll have a set of activities which will be synchronized to ensure synergy and leverage. In stage one, which will run from 2021 to 2023, to involve the preparation and option, and option phase, which will be phase one. And in this phase, it is assumed that anthrax is present, but the socioeconomic uh, impact is not known. The burden of the disease is not known. Then stage two, it will involve the implementation of the strategy in the high risk zones, which will run from 2024 to 2027. In this uh, phase, the situation is that we know the disease impact, the burden, we have implementation plan in place. And from that uh, implementation plan, we'll have identified areas where anthrax is more causing more burden, and this will be the high risk areas. And this is where the, implement, the implementation of the strategy will start to eliminate human anthrax in these areas. As we move to stage three, where the implementation of the strategy will be, uh, will be done across the country, ready from 2028 to 2032. In this stage, we'll sustain the efforts we have done in phase two and apply the lessons we have learned in the high risk zones and now control this disease across the whole country. Then phase four, this is the stage where anthrax will be eliminated in humans, such that we have zero case of human cases and rare cases in livestock. In phase one, this is where most of the activities will be done because we do not know exactly the burden of the disease and a number of things have to be put in place to implement, to operationalize the strategy. And one will start with developing guidelines and standard operating procedures, which will enable us to operationalize this strategy. Uh, guidelines such as vaccination, guidelines, treatment guidelines, among others. Then we'll strengthen surveillance to ensure that we receive all the data or the outbreak on timely and also response to an outbreak. We'll also have a resource mapping and resource mobilization where in this we have to develop um, resource mobilization plans have meetings and advocacy meetings in the national, count, national and the county governments and other stakeholders to source for funds to implement the strategy. Prevention and control measures in both human, animals and wildlife to ensure that there is no um, spillover of the, the disease to humans and also contamination of the environment. We'll also um, develop communication plans, identify the audience, and also um, the communication channel will be identified at this stage. And also conduct uh, research so that we may identify the high risk and the low risk areas, and also know and understand the economic burden of anthrax in the country. It is at this stage that we'll also form the elimination committees. At the national level, we'll have the National Prevention and Control Committee, which will be a subcommittee of the Zoonotic Technical Working Group, and Zoonotic Disease Unit will be the Secretariat. This committee will coordinate and oversee anthrax prevention control across the country. This committee will also have members from the international, regional, and other national partners. At the county level, a similar committee will be formed, 
which consists of which will be called the county zoonotic committee. And the county one health units will be the secretariat. They will be reporting direct to the National Prevention Committee and Control Committee, which will in turn will, re will report to Zoonotic Tenkowaki Group. And this group will now report to the ministries of agriculture, livestock and fisheries, the Minister of Health. At the sub count level, similar committee will be formed, which will be direct to the communities where the implementation will be taking place. And the information will flow now from the community to the sub count level, to the county level, to the national level. Uh, High-risk areas will be identified, but from the review of records, although uh, this anthrax is endemic in the country, it has been reported in some counties more often than others. And it's from that review that this map was developed. Start Narok, Kiambu, Meru, Nyeri, had reported more anthrax cases in the past five years than other counties. And these were identified as the high risk areas where the pilot of this anthrax strategy will be developed, will start being implemented. However, in the first phase, through the op operational research, the risk map of anthrax will be developed. And now it will be updated in the strategy which will be the real risk map for anthrax and will be used for implementation of this strategy. Within these areas where anthrax will be occurring, there will be hotspots. And this will range from one to 50 kilometers based on production systems. Low risk areas will have, will have those areas where anthrax outbreaks has not occurred in the last five years. However, if anthrax outbreaks occurs in these areas. It will be now classified as high risk areas and activities taking place in the high risk areas will now be done in that area. Phase two, it is assumed that all structures have been, infrastructures be put in place and now we are ready to start implementation of the strategy. And this implementation will start in the high risk zones where advocacy, communication, social mobilization will be done. Vaccines will be procured, distributed. Anthrax cases will be collected. Data on outbreak will be collected and fed to national anthrax database. Assessment of economic cost analysis intervention will be done. Outbreak investigation and response will be done as well as communication across the counties across the border and impact of the vaccination will also be assessed as well as vaccination zero survey and also training of the human and the veterinary personnel to ensure that they understand the control of anthrax. To move from this phase to the next phase, we'll ensure that some indicators will be used to show that we need to move to the next step. And this will include vaccination of 80% of the livestock in the high risk areas. And three rounds of vaccination will be key during that period. That any outbreaks which will be reported in that phase, at least 80% of these outbreaks are laboratory confirmed. And reduce the incidence of anthrax in both human and livestock by 50% of the baseline. Also redu reduce the anthrax case of human livestock wildlife interface by 50% of the baseline. At phase three, it will aim to sustain the achievement of the stage two. And this is where we'll be implementing the anthrax prevention control strategy across the country. And here we'll apply the lessons which have been learned in the high risk areas. And they, the activities will include advocacy, communication, social mobilization, item surveillance to make sure we 
get information on time of N outbreaks, vaccination figures, sustained livestock vaccination. We'll review and update the national anthrax risk map and evaluate the effectiveness of programs or the intervention which will be applied as well as communication across the counties. To move from this phase, the last phase, the instance of anthrax is anim in animals and livestock will have reduced by 80% of the baseline, as well as reduction of human livestock wildlife interface by 80%. And the country will have at least vaccinated 80% of the susceptible animals against anthrax. Elimination of anthrax in humans will be the last phase. And this will be defined by having no human anthrax in a certain region. And in this region, there will be surveillance going on to make sure that there's no human case which is missed. At the same time, there will be sustained elimination activities in areas where the anthrax cases will be reported. These areas which have not reported anthrax cases at least for two consecutive years will be declared as anthrax free. This implementation will monitored and evaluated both internally and externally. And for the internal monitoring, it will be, there, it will be led by a zoonotic disease unit, whereby they have developed, developed uh, very, very, very viable indicators. They will measure the progress and assess the achievement of the program in line with the strategy. While external evaluation will be independent to assess the program and identify any modifications. We want to acknowledge this uh, organization for financial support while developing this strategy. Thank you. And this is the strategy. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. I am sure that uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Nanyingi was happy to see the strategy. Sindio Nanyingi, Mark. All right. Now, uh, just a few questions for you, uh, I think, uh, which might be critical for you to address before we move on to the next session. The one, uh, a former DVS, Dr. Kisangewa, is asking the strategy has moved to 2021 to 2036. What has shifted? Maybe you might not be the competent authority to answer, but uh, there's a DVS representative who might help you. Uh, the second bit of it is uh, we are in the preparatory adoption phase, which should run from 2021 to 2023. 2021 is over, 2022 might be lost due to elections. How far have you done the preparations? Again, uh, you can pick those together. And the last bit of it is, uh, is there any role for private sector in the strategy? And have they been sensitized, engaged? Because I think a lot of strategies have been developed internally as a government, but maybe the, to drive PPPs, private sector that might need to play an important role need to also be engaged and is that part of the process and lastly uh, there was a question by Maureen uh, and Edda the challenges in getting vaccines and essentially the, 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 the strategy is hinged on vaccinating a certain number of the population so would you have any comments around the vaccines and vaccination bits of it I'm sure Dr. Ayas might be able to put in one or two, but we'll start with uh, 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 Augusta, then Dr. Ayas can put in one or two, then we can close the session. So, Th Thank you for the questions. Um, we, have, we are in phase one, and we have uh, take, undertaken some of the activities. We have developed um, guidelines and uh, we are developing the risk map as well as um, preparing to undertake other activities as we in the near future. 
uh, we have involved the, sec the private sector during the development of the strategy and is also one of the key stakeholders which will be involved in implementation of this strategy. Uh, we aim at vac vaccinating at least 80% of the population and we believe that uh, this will build uh, the ideal and such that uh, this will be um, eight, uh, 70 to 80% vaccination coverage is always uh, said to be effective in control of our disease. Thank you. Can request Dr. Yas to chip in. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Dr. Kibundi, for the good presentation on the anthrax strategy. Uh, mine uh, is to react to the comments uh, that have come in. Uh, the, one was the question of when will it start? I, I would say it has already started in the sense that for us to come up with a strategy, there's a lot of epidemiological work that had already been undertaken. So the first phase of knowing um, the extent of the threat of uh, anthrax in the country, the risk factors and all that has been undertaken. And from there is when we now moved to developing the, the strategy itself. So it's evidence-based. Um, the various uh, um, pillars that have come up are based on evidence that has been collected over a long time. Uh, the strategy itself has not been officially launched, but we are planning to have it done within the next coming one month. With the launch of the document, we'll now go full steam ahead to do the rollout with the, our country, the challenge is that we have 47 governments. Disease control is devolved. The money to do the control is out there in the counties. So we have to convince them that this is a priority and that they need to now work on it uh, as uh, one of the key deliverables in the coming uh, years. The private sector role Again, with the launch, we expect that we will bring them on board. They will be uh, part of the people who will be invited to the launch, key private sector people, so that they can contribute, they can take it home and look for their niche within the, with the programs that are there. Um, I, I, I must admit uh, vaccines can be a challenge. Uh, but we do expect that once the counties take it up and they put it in their CIDP as one of the activities, we can then work with them to um, access the vaccines. Uh, the OIE has made a good offer that they can uh, supply vaccines at a very good cost if we go as a country. So we can take the various requirements of the counties and approach the OIE and get the vaccine at a very reasonable cost. Yeah, have I answered? Yeah, thank you, Daksari. I think uh, more can be you can be engaged uh, on 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 the chat for more, and I'm sure your office is accessible. So those of us who are interested can easily also get to that uh, space. I want to bring this uh, session to a conclusion by thanking you all for actively participating. There's very good discussions going on on chat, including the fact that Valentina Andolo, who did the special presentation, is available and I can see she's responding to questions that are there. So please continue the chat and the discussions at that level. I'm sure all these things are available. Uh, Liam tells me they will be circulated. So any presentation, any questions can be picked up following this. And with those few remarks, I want you to give yourself an applause for being a good uh, participants for this session. And then I'll call Nick to come and do the reflective section and reactions to Menti before the tea, a coffee break. So Nick, over to you. Thank you.
All right, thank you very much, Dr. Victor Yamo for moderating that session. Maybe you can give him another round of applause. Yeah. So today we've had on the policy, we've had a lot of talks. We've had a lot of talks on One Health and we're lucky today to have the, our policymakers with us. So on Menti, we'd love to hear some of your comments on how we can engage our policymakers to, to make things better. So the Menti code is 33519760. We'd love to hear what you'd like to say to the policymakers in terms of how One Health can be implemented in Kenya and even around. Dr. Wayas earlier had mentioned that we do have 47 counties. So would, would people want a unified or they'd want funding? most of the funding for these activities. We have people asking for maybe more of policymakers engagement with the donors, more policies, more policy to be created that will involve multidisciplinary teams, more evidence-based from the policymakers or from the practitioners. Yeah, we need to, they are, they are asking to break silos, especially by the government sectors. I think they're proposing to have more One Health Forum more involvement of private sectors. Yeah, more dissemination of this. I think they're asking for more conferences by government, organized by government and non-governmental organization. Yeah, institutionalization of One Health. So I think this swings back to you as the policymakers on how we can incorporate One Health more and more. So keep your comments coming with this will be captured as we move along. Right now, we are going to break for coffee. Then we, we resume at 3.40 PM, where we look at some of the books that Ildri have created, then we'll move to our keynote speakers. Thank you, everyone. And let's keep giving in our comments. Sante. All right, I think we can go on to the next session. Uh, coffee is still there. You can pick it as, uh, on, uh, when you need. And for our online participants, I hope you've gotten a cup of tea or something. And uh, we'll start the next session by inviting my namesake, Michael Victor, to make a presentation on highlights of Ildri's impact book. Karibu, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Or should I say Victor? Yeah, just say Victor, the two <laughs> Victors together. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good, after, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Victor, uh, Head of Communications and Knowledge Management at ORI. I'm unfortunately a poor substitute for the person who was supposed to speak uh, for this uh, Delia Grace, who is really one of the, the leading figures, as you guys know, in uh, zoonotic disease and in food safety. Uh, and we just wanted to quickly kind of talk about uh, a new book that came out early this year on the impacts of uh, you know, ILRI's and partners research uh, on kind of livestock and zoonotic disease and whatnot. Uh, so the impact of International Livestock Research Institute is a book that spans about 40 years of research at ILRI. You know, uh, ILRI was comprised of uh, the ILRAD and ILCA, uh, the two institutions, one based in Ethiopia and one based in, uh, in Nairobi which combined in, I think it was about 1992. So it's, it's both those research, how they combined in about 1990 and moved on. And uh, this is really the, the first evidence-based global estimate of many of the, the work that had been done by uh, ILRI and its partners. And it really kind of documents in not just an institutional history, so it just doesn't tell the story of ILRI and how it evolved, but really tells, you know, gives the first evidence base for uh, some of the major developments that happened within ILRI uh, and the impacts of its research. And here's the book. It's really good for doing curls, 
if you need to do because it's very heavy. Uh, and I, you know, I've read it. You know, it doesn't put me to sleep too much. I had to read it, and I've had to use it for certain things. And if you are a researcher in livestock, and you know that spans all these four areas, you know, animal genetics, production, and human health, primary production, tropical livestock systems and policies, and the future of livestock research. But it spans a whole range of uh, disciplines around livestock production, from the animal and human health side all the way to the genetic side. And yeah, if you're interested in this, it's, it's really a good read in terms of how a lot of the, the issues have evolved over the years, and we'll take you through some of those. But there's a lot of, uh, related to One Health, there's a lot of chapters, and uh, there's something on the control of path pathogens, in per particularly in uh, trypanomyces. Did I say that right? Trypano, yeah, okay, that. <laughs> Kind of sound like Trump or something, you know, we're trying to pronounce that one. Uh, yeah, uh, but you, you know, there's, there's that on the CTC, on the impact assessment of immunology and immunoparasitology, transboundary animal disease, zoonosis, and food safety. And I think this really shows the antecedents of One Health and how kind of One Health has emerged. And, you know, that was the story that I read when we started talking particularly about zoonosis and food safety and nutrition. You really see how we move from a more of a kind of a sectoral approach to a one health approach. So that was quite interesting. So, you know, the chapter on zoonosis really kind of provides the, you know, you know, kind of the antecedents where we did the first kind of global synthesis on the impacts of zoonotic disease. Uh, we look at the global burden of animal disease uh, and really outlines kind of the issues of how, you know, moving from zoonotic disease towards zoonotic research and then into uh, veterinary and one health approaches. So again, it really, that, that section is quite interesting and, uh, and it's something that you could really see the kind of trajectory evolution of zoonotic disease research and how that has moved into one health uh, approaches. Next slide. Uh, and again, the other one that you know, is really interesting is food safety and nutrition and where we've had a lot of impacts. Uh, you know, and you know a lot of stuff there as well, looking at foodborne disease and the global burden of animal disease as well. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into this too much because I'm not a uh, specialist in this. Next slide. Uh, so if you want to find it, it's, you know, we, we have selected number of copies of this uh, and you could find it online as well. So you just go to the, go to ilri.org and ilri research impact and we can put that into the chat. Uh, I think Christina has. And you can download the book for uh, free, the whole book or different chapters. Uh, you can find it on Twitter if you follow Ilri or uh, 45 Years of Impact. And again, if you want to get further information on different chapters, you can contact uh, the people on this list. So that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. I think now we can move on to the next session. And to begin us in the next session, I would like to invite a good friend of mine, we use the same route when you are going to the village uh, to make a presentation on experiences and lessons from development and implementation of One Health policies in Africa. Uh, the, the, this is our keynote that will be made by Dr. Mark Nanyingi from FAO and University of uh, Liverpool. Dr. Mark Nanyingi is an infectious disease epidemiologist and a one health expert with a broader interest in zoonotic viral hemorrhagic fevers. He holds a PhD in epidemiology and a master's in pharmacology and toxicology. He trained as a vet surgeon and progressively trained in spatial epidemiology of emerging infectious diseases at John Hopkins and uh, Yale. And in 2007, he established the spatial data infrastructure for health research at Kemri Wellcome Trust, Kilifi. He has extensive training in One Health, biosecurity, biosafety, and pandemic preparedness. He has previously consulted for World Bank in development of guidelines for public health preparedness on climate-sensitive infectious diseases and European Union Directorate of Health in public health responses to foodborne infections. In the last decade, he has involved in collaborate. He has been involved in collaborative research with Kemri. CDC, ECP, and USAMRA, Walter Reed, in, co in coordination of national abovirus vector surveillance and risk mapping in Kenya. 
He has been the lead epidemiologist for World Health Organization TRD project on climate change and early warning systems for vector-borne diseases in Kenya. And he's, he is experienced in government, public administration, one health policy advocacy and communication where he collaborates with Zoonotic Disease Unit by provision of scientific and technical guidance of the Kenyan government on one health and zoonotic diseases. Uh, with that, that introduction, I am sure you are ready and waiting to hear from these experts. So Karibu Dr. Nanyingi, the floor is yours for the next 15 or so minutes. My name is Mark, as, as Vix has introduced me, and uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is just a, a so, sort of analysis of what we've been trying to do collaboratively locally and in the region, and uh, what uh, one, health, one health efforts that have been building mo mo momentum for the last decade. Um, I am a visiting scientist here at Hillary, and I work with Eric Fav under the, the Horn project, uh, the Horn project in the middle. And um, we have been working with many other organizations. So uh, currently, we are advising the government of Kenya through the Zoonotic D Disease Unit as uh, the FAO Actard program to develop uh, policies and guidelines. Uh, for example, what uh, Agasa has just talked about, that's one of our outputs that we are we're going to, you know, the, the momentum to go that. So, um, the outline of my presentation is that I, I just want to give a snapshot of global, regional, and, and local efforts of what has been happening and, and to show the interconnectedness of how this is an additive way of having a common achievement. Uh, when you work together as one health, you bring together very many dis disciplines. The focus for this talk is that we want to see how implementation moves to operationalize and finally how you can institutionalize because you need to embed this into national policies as you move forward. And um, uh, why do we need to, to develop policies? Or why do we need to develop guidelines? I think apart from the planning financially, you need to have uh, sort of agreements where um, if you want to have an outcome, you're looking at specific public health hazards, you're looking at specific emerging uh, diseases or foodborne diseases as uh, a previous speaker here from, I think Richard talked about, you need a common way of looking at it. And the plants here have been ignored for a very long time, but then we are seeing them sneaking in here as part of the One Health in a, a shared environment. So that's where we need it to help us to plan better, but at the same time also it will help us actually just to have a common way of working from uh, the, the various se sectors that are involved in this. But it's a long process. And this is not a template for, for, for Kenya, but this is just a general way that probably how policies will be developed. For some of us who have been involved in developing guidelines and strategies for the country, this is a common approach that you have to use. But the most important thing is after you review the available material and literature that exists, is relevant to One Health or infectious diseases, you need actually to go to the stakeholders and then develop a framework that is now go going to have a governance structure whereby it has to have a political buy. -in. So apart from having accountability issues, that you need partners and, and people actually to buy into your story. There has to be a, a document that actually guides you. And that's why it's very important to do this. But M and E is very important in terms of doing this. At FAO, we have developed the One Health Monitoring Tool that takes account and it takes you a, a stepwise way actually to understand on are you having investments that are re realistic or are you just throwing your money into implementing One Health pro pro programs? On December 1st this year, uh, the One Health Expert Panel that has been 26 individuals from various countries. We are privileged to have our own Kenyan Salome Bukashi actually sitting in this panel and they redefined One Health. And uh, previously it has been silent on plant uh, health, but now we are seeing an ecosystems approach whereby for sustainable way to balance and optimize health, not just for human beings, you have to actually look at the ecosystems and the animals that exist in this system. So this definition is going to create an impetus for us forward. This is, is going to uh, ignite a lot of collaboration to coordinate this, also to focus on issues of one health uh, workforce capacity building. And at the same time, you want to communicate better to the stakeholders. So, I mean, this December, this has been a milestone in terms of just bringing this uh, uh, out uh, very clearly. But the most important thing is that the trapezoid, which is composed of FAO, which chairs the trapezoid right now, and OIE and WHO, 
has been very systematic actually in developing tools. The teaser G is a, is a very good template that actually allows you to understand how collaborations are done, uh, how well are uh, probably, at what extent can you define a zoonotic disease? Is AMR and food safety part of this? Has AMR or food safety been ignored? And I think these are some of the issues that have been, and I liked uh, the previous speakers actually who touched on issues to do with food safety, that we sometimes we put it on the backdrop and don't really want to bring it on the forefront of this. And countries just adopt this as a template. But the most important thing is that based on a country experience, you have also to have a best practice or way of actually implementing this. And that's why it's very important actually to see what the chapters have been doing uh, over the years. So the TZG will actually focus on a few areas. And these operational tools, they're the ones actually that help us to focus on some key you know, technical areas. And one of the areas that probably I'll just highlight is the, the MCM, what you call the multi-sectoral one health coordination. But we have some technical areas in terms of uh, conducting a joint risk assessment, what we call the JRA and the One Health Workforce Development, which is being done by many organizations, including Afrohun, which has championed this curriculum development in terms of One Health Workforce Development and the, and the UC Davis. So as we move forward, these tools are the ones which actually guide from the global perspective to the national perspective to be able actually to adopt are some of these tools. And some of the documents probably that we have contributed for over some time is that even the World Bank has an interest actually in funding One Health Research and provides um, a very good, uh, if you go online and look at uh, ReadySA, you'll see actually what they do. And this is like a blueprint, which, which actually they use to, to, to take stock and maybe prioritize areas that are going to fund. And AMR actually is emerging very strongly as we move forward. So we move from the global level and then we come to the African Union. The African CDC and uh, the auspices of, of the African Union based in Addis Ababa has over the years actually championed now by endorsing a One Health approach, by creating these fr frameworks that are actually going to be best pr 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 practices in tackling uh, what we call zoonotic diseases. But the main thing is you have to share your data. You have to establish the systems but at the same time actually enable to strengthen One Health coordination and collaboration. So what we are seeing here is that One Health approach is really taking center stage, even at our own African perspective. But then this report here has been highly cited, and I think it was developed by scientists from Ilri here, including Bernard Bett and others. And it actually outlines that we are having spillovers all over the place, from the environment back to the, the ecosystem and we're having, you know, humans, you know, coming in, as you can clearly see, how do we break this chain of transmission? If you're looking at COVID-19 of which this report focuses on, for the first time, the United Nations Environmental Program now becomes the fourth arm of the trapezoid. So we had FAO, OIE, and WHO, and now UNEP comes in actually to really bring in the environmental aspect, which we have been actually missing into this. So we can mainstream One Health approaches by building capacity, by enhancing actually what we call M and E, and focusing on governance. And our discussions today are actually going to be on governance. How does governance actually be allowed? And our first tool of the seven tools is the MCM. This is a 10 step, you know, kind of a process whereby you have to take stock and you have to, you know, have a team working together and choose the areas of, of, of of collaboration that you're going to focus on. But the key elements that guide us in terms of moving forward, we, we can be focused on leadership and governance and the policies and legal, legal frameworks. And this is the, the whole discussion that we've been having here. How do you fund activities? What do you base on? Actually, if you want to fund some of these activities, you can't just come out nowhere probably with a big money of bag and then drop it somewhere else. So this, there are very many core elements, but the focus for this talk, we are going to look at leadership and governance and those frameworks that have been established across the continent or across the Horn of Africa and efforts actually to prioritize zoonotic diseases or events. So the MCM actually, it forms a template that guides us as we move forward. And again, this work, I think it was a commission by Oreca, uh, led by Fasina, uh, who we, we also work with. And you look at, the, the, the way they have mapped out all these organizations and come up with many of these activities. And these activities keep on varying. But the most important thing that you have to look at is that 
we are narrowing this to only the human and animal issues. And this is actually the weakest link that as we move forward. This study did a very interesting thing because actually tried to look at the powers of interest. So you want to see how does actually power influence whether they're decision makers or funders in that. And uh, conversely, you find that in terms of you can have a very good correlation between the interest and influence in terms of decision making, but then you find there's some you know, poor correlation and this can be actually influenced by sector specific priorities, whereby you have the policies that are segmented to each sector, but they are not really merging into the other. So I think I like this uh, uh, work that actually Oreka uh, uh, had a, a lot of input in, which was published, and it gives us a lot of uh, uh, focus where we can see where activities are done. For example, uh, the East African region uh, has taken a huge lead over other areas, whereby you find that over probably a hundred and so initiatives, activities are being done in the East African region. But what is happening in the in the in the in the in the in the western part of, of Africa and probably the, the southern part? So we need to bring together these continental efforts actually to see land-based practices from other, other areas of the, of, the, of the continent. And actually, as we move forward and understand this, and this actually propelled us to um, understand, uh, for example, what has been happening in our country as Kenya. I'll be a bit biased because I'm Kenyan and just trying to give a story of how you know, the Kenyan Zoonotic Disease Unit was established. The Kenyan disease, the ZDU is the national uh, One Health platform, actually, which had been just presented by the previous speakers, uh, just Augusta. And this has been a long journey, I think, all the way from probably almost 30 years ago when we had the, the Kenya Rabies group that was under, you know, the South and East African uh, Rabies group. So due to the sporadic emergencies of, of these cases, but this journey actually gained momentum in 1998, 1999, when we had the 1997 Rift Valley Fever outbreak, which was huge uh, 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 in the East African region. The, the technical committee has been in existence for all these years until even the outbreaks that have happened during the 2021 or 2020 in the East African region. But the milestones that happened beyond the, the HPI task force was in 2012, when they were able actually to develop a strategic plan which actually was endorsed by both ministers of health and at that time minister of livestock to come up with the first strategic plan that actually brought to the establishment of the zoonotic disease unit but a very very significant uh, effort happened i think in 2014 when we were able actually to develop the national strategic plan which was being led by the zdu and a lot of support from other organizations like uh, the wsu uh, led by dumbi and others and then we move forward very quickly to this year, actually, to showcase some of the, the One Health strategic plan, uh, the anthrax that she was presenting, and also the brucellosis uh, uh, control and prevention strategy. So we have this trilogy of, of documents that we are going to launch very soon that actually are going to put Kenya on the, the global stage, actually, as, as a leading force in terms of actual implementation. Of that. So after we look at how the ZDU is structured, and I think she had mentioned this, so I always really want to be labeled on this. The main emphasis that I, on the left side is that do we have a need to co-opt other sectors? Do we need the environment to bring in the environment actually to provide support for this? Do we need to bring in wildlife monitoring? So while the core functions are being run by vets and medical epidemiologists who run the, uh, the, the entire unit, it also cascades lower to the county one health units, which I'll be talking about in the next slide up to the sub-county sub level. But the most significant thing is to bring together all these sectors as per defined by the recent definition of One Health by uh, the expert panel, that probably we need to look beyond just these two disciplines and expand this. For us to institutionalize One Health approach, we need evidence also from these other sectors. And this is what we call the county One Health units. In 2015, um, we piloted the county one health units with the, with the CDC office in Kenya to actually try to mirror what is happening at the national level. And we can bring it down to see if the same thing can be done at the county level. And in 2021, with the support from the, the global implementation solutions, uh, we have been able actually to develop the county one health curriculum that are based on 
tools of surveillance, joint response, uh, probably AMR, communication, um, risk assessment, and so on and so forth. But some of these modules were heavily borrowed from Afrohoon. And Afrohoon, as most of you know, I think Helen talked about it yesterday, and Sam is in the room also here, is that their leaders actually in terms of the One Health Workforce Development. So from bridging the academia aspect and bringing in together the industry, developing these curriculums actually has helped the ZDU that will now go down to put down courses on data sharing and information. How well can we coordinate this? And then finally, a big story of policy and legislation. So the County One Health Unit, again, will put Kenya on the global map because we are going to see how you can trickle down actually the way to implement and institutionalize One Health. And I, I bring this story by uh, this paper from Uganda, which actually has also showcased their journey that began way, way back. I think they began in 1980 when the veterinary public health division was embedded in the Ministry of Health. And this pro probably was a milestone at that time, but they have come a long, a long way tackling African trypanosomiasis. And I think in 2017, uh, from this publication by uh, this team, they had their National One Health Platform. But there's some uniqueness about their National One Health Platform that is not in our Kenyan one. You find that they have the high level One Health Technical Working Group that has all these director of animal resources, director of health services, but a key thing, they have the environment embedded in and wildlife. And so these are some of the, the lessons that we can learn that while we have ours strongly embedded into only two sectors, other countries actually have elevated it and actually brought it and even down to the district level, what we call for our case, the count one health unit. So East African countries or countries across Africa can learn from each other actually on how to operationalize and implement most of the One Health programs. And you need a lot of resources actually to go ahead and do this kind of thing. So I'll not really go one by one, but for you to plan better, to share information very well, you need frameworks. And some of these frameworks are set, for example, the AHR, uh, by the WHO, you have the terrestrial guide by OIE, and then you have the CODIS elementaries. But the most important thing is you have to have the expert networks. The way the zoonotic technical working groups work in these countries is that they are led by the twin directors of health. But then they have subject matter experts being led by researchers from ILRI, KEMRI, and other organizations, actually, which provide support for this. So we have the National Action Plan for Security in place, for example, in Kenya, and all these other documents that actually can guide us to move forward. This can be replicated in any other country because you, this is, is uh, uh, what probably uh, when you were developing the strategies for Rwanda, we had this kind of approach that we used. And what is a joint external evaluation? So this is a very systematic way of looking at pandemic preparedness. And you have about 19 key steps that you have to go through. It is a voluntary process, but again, it enables you after every five years actually to review. Now, it will tell you if a country has the ability to respond well to an infectious disease. Kenya did its JE in 2017. And what we saw after having this and the ZDU took lead into this, that all these 17 areas of capacity, we focus, for example, on the global health security agendas packages, which we have this notice package, we have the AMR package and other package. So in line with the global health security agenda, what we are looking at, where are we as a country and where are we going? If you have a score of one, then we are doing too badly. But if we have a score of about four, then we are doing very well. And in Kenya, you can see, for example, AMR, um, and maybe I'll focus on zoonotic diseases here. You find that surveillance systems for, for, for the zoonotic disease and mechanisms actually to do this. And we are at three, so meaning that we have some capacity going forward. But then you find that we have probably an area on antimicrobial resistance. We had two, so some limited capacity, but this was in 2017. So the purpose of the JEE, which will be tied together to what we call the performance of veterinary services, is to try and bridge the gap of what is happening on the side of the human health via the AHR guidelines, which were developed in 2005, and what is going to happen actually on the, on the, on the veterinary side. And that brings us to this activity that we did last month uh, we brought together experts from uh, the WHO, led by the WHO regional office. And the ZDU coordinated this with the animal health experts, human health experts. And it's very important to bridge the gap. So if you want to move forward and have a platform of probably establishing how to institutionalize this, the One Health is a commonality between what happens in the human health and what happens in the, in the animal health. 
And what the PVS and IHR bridging workshop does is that it tries to harness those areas of commonality, those weaknesses that exist in both systems. And this will be what will be prioritized by the country. So we were able actually to prioritize key areas that have been listed here. We had about 12, but we started with looking at the joint risk assessment will be very key to look at that. But those are more technical. The most priority that we are looking at as a country right now is that for us to move the ZDU from where it exists under the directorates to a higher office, probably under the presidents. So if you, you establish that directorate, and I'll talk about that at the end, is that now you can have more funding and you can actually prioritize that. But you have all this continent flowing together between what happens in the veterinary aspect and what happens actually in the, in the public health aspect. So this is the main purpose of the HR and the PVS. And this work took us a lot of time under the Horn project. And what we wanted to do is that we went out there and we wanted to understand what has been reported in the Horn of Africa. Where has it been reported? Which country has done a lot of work on this? And all the publications that have been churned all over the years, we were able to, to synthesize all these publications. And this work was led by my colleague, Lisa, who we work with. And we were able actually, for example, you can see that Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya have just picked a few. We did Somali, Djibouti, and all that. And where you see the red line on that graph is when they had prioritized the zoonotic diseases. So at that time, you realize that probably the number of publications might start going up because focus is being given to specific diseases that you're going to work with. But the most important thing is you want to analyze which domain, where are we having the interface? If you look at the Venn diagrams that you're bringing together, you find that as we want to prioritize these diseases, rabies takes a huge share probably on the human aspect where the analysis is being done. And anthrax, brucellosis, Rift Valley fever, and all those diseases. But then you find that the human, the animal aspect actually predominates all these sectors in terms of whether they are doing risk surveys, whether they're doing epidemiology studies, or just probably CAP studies. This work actually uh, was sort of, uh, you know, going back and trying to understand what has been happening in the region for over the years. So we call this paper actually 100 years of scoping, and we are just looking at what is happening in the Horn of Africa. But the most important thing is, based on that paper, which came probably much later, these efforts have been going on to try and prioritize diseases. And why do you want to prioritize diseases? You want to prioritize diseases because that's where you're going to put your money. That's where your policies are going to focus on. And the CDC has designed a tool, uh, what we call uh, the OHZP. And this tool actually is a, is a, is a semi-quantitative tool whereby you want to understand what happens in a country with rotary disease. So in 2015, in Kenya, on the last map, we actually prioritized those diseases. We started with anthrax, trypanosomiasis, rabies, brucellosis, rift valley fever. And these were very many, about 35 diseases, but we, you only want to focus on the first five. And the criteria actually is based on few, on few issues. We, you want to see the socioeconomic impact. Does this disease actually really cause loss? Why do you want actually to tackle this disease? Does this disease actually cause severe illness in humans? Or does this disease actually, does it have an epidemic potential slash pandemic potential, what we, what we have seen? And as you can see, many countries have followed the CDC tool to actually operationalize this. Sekemata in 2018 and others actually uh, ranked seven diseases in Uganda, as you can see. But in Nigeria, actually this year, a paper which was published and actually it had also some uh, Kenyan authors, Matthew Muturi and others helped actually to do this process. I mean, you can see rabies is very common in these countries. If you look at, at, uh, at uh, the four countries that we have used across Africa, you find that there's a community of diseases. So it's very important to standardize most of these tools. But this is our biggest achievement so far in the 12 year journey that we've walked. We have actually been able to revise our old strategy. And we have the strategy here, which actually the director of veterinary services was talking about. We're going to launch it very soon and based on the guidelines that are going to be developed. So this, this uh, strategy, the Kenya National One Health Strategy, is a blanket of two other strategies that will come down here. What Augusta was talking about, and also we have a resources strategy that has to be in place. But the main thing is that the first objective of this actually really, really focuses on implementation issues and digitalization. The others probably are applied research, which will see the importance of doing applied research, and probably just to, to strengthen surveillance. 
So I think this is a very big step for Kenya as we move into the, the, the next phase to try in the next five years actually to roll out this strategic plan and probably have more impetus to see if we need to summarize into a policy document. But based on the two things that I talked earlier, the JE and the PVS, which you are now familiar with, trying to find those you know, areas of convergence or weaknesses, both in the human health and animal health, Kenya developed a national action plan for health security um, in 2017. And this, when you look at this uh, national action plan for health security, it really brings out the strength of capacity building when you're looking at the One Health approach. These institutional capacities that you want actually to implement issues to do IHR, it's mandatory actually to bring in the One Health approach. And that's why the contributions of both sectors after undertaking the stock of the PVS and the JEE, they came up to develop this document, which is now being funded. Actually, it is a costed uh, strategic plan, which is actually going to propel the country forward. And as I said, uh, being a Kenyan, I'll be very, very uh, systematic. So we, we have the, the, the avian influenza contingency plan, and we are re recently about to, to revise the Rift Valley Fever contingency plan, which has been worked on for many, many years, actually by leading researchers in, in, uh, in Rift Valley Fever in this country. And the purpose of this is that you keep on updating it because you want to create guidelines and SOPs that you're going to use. But I mentioned the, the rabies plan uh, as earlier in the discussion. And then Augusta just talked about the anthrax uh, strategy. And then also, we also have uh, this uh, brucellosis and the One Health strategy that we have, we have launched. So I think as we move forward, we are seeing the outputs of the efforts that we are putting in as a country. And Another project that I was involved in, this we funded by WHO and TDR in, in Baringo, Kenya, and Edna Mtua yesterday actually presented part of uh, the findings from this study, uh, part of the anthropological work, is that you can develop policies or strategies at a much lower level. So when we went to Baringo, Kenya, and we conducted the One Health study between malaria and Rift Valley fever in these populations, and we were able actually to create policy briefs, both for malaria and a policy brief for Rift Valley fever. And this policy brief, has been used by Baringo County and probably it can be emulated by other neighboring counties which have probably the same ecological drivers of this disease. So it's very important actually to see on how you can unpackage all these issues from the much higher level and then you move forward. Why do you do research? You don't do research just for fancy publishing. You want to do research that is impactful. You want to see these communities actually have these messages that are very simple and they can be able actually to use these messages actually to protect their livestock and at the same time protecting themselves from vector-borne diseases like Rift Valley Fever. And FAO commissioned mapping of the One Health activities in Kenya, and this was led by the Zoonotic Disease Unit once again. And what we find here that despite that we have uh, some gains in One Health, our country being covered in a very nice map, and you find that most of the One Health activities probably are more based in areas that have high livestock uh, populations. You see the up north, I think in Marsabit, and probably now we are starting to see a shift, so, sort of an epidemiological shift, whereby we are seeing now more activities going to areas that are semi-intensive, and this is what urbanization does. So you see actually coming up of most of these diseases from areas that probably were not prevalent to, to some of these diseases. We provide this as a template, and in terms to operationalize some of these things that this can be emulated by other countries, actually, when you map out the activities then you know where you want to go, you know where you want to put your money. So for you to be able actually to move forward, you want to check on the technical areas and what we looked at, and I'll not really go into all the areas, I'll just look at this one area of institutional policy and legislative frameworks. This came out very prominently. We talked to experts in One Health, in medical research and everything, and it came out very, very clearly that the areas that has, have to be given priority in terms of interventions, these were areas in creating conducive legislative frameworks and at the same time actually creating institutional policies that are going to drive One Health agenda forward. And part of that, and we were just discussing this with Harry at the break, is that um, how is One Health funded in most of these countries? One Health is funded, being driven by priorities by the donor organizations or donor countries. When do we have an aspect of probably understanding the priorities of One Health funding are going to be driven by our own courses? Do we have probably budget lines in our countries, for example, Kenya, 
And the DVS has also provided some support. And now I know the Ministry of Health has actually put a division that actually looks at specifically the, 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 the zoonotic disease unit. So, and in not really becoming biased, this is a, a donor-driven agenda that is actually you know, supporting most of these activities. Well, you see the CDC, the USAID, most of the activities, what we do 100% in FAO are being funded by the Global Health Security Agenda, which is a, GS, a, a USAID pro project. So all the organizations that are coming in, we need to have a national agenda and a conversation to see where we can put our money and how we can prioritize where to actually, how to control uh, you know, emerging infectious diseases and more so one health events. And some of the policies that have been in the, in, the, in the pipeline for a very long time, we have the health policy, we have the veterinary bill, we have the animal health bill. It's very, very important to see that you can have a bill, but also at the same time, you can have a policy. So we have some acts that are also very active in this country that are actually helping us to move forward. So when you look at existence of some of these uh, policies and you look at the instruments, instruments are now bills. They are not actually policies as such. How is Kenya doing this is that for us to intervene better, for us to prioritize on how we're going to institutionalize this, we need to strengthen our legal frameworks and actually cassette this to a lower level. And this slide is very interesting because um, we, 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 we supported uh, Cameroon actually to do this work and, and more recently actually Tanzania has completed its strategic plan. What comes out very clearly in this uh, comparative you know, outline is that you find in Tanzania, the office, the national health platform in terms of governance is placed at the prime minister's office. That's a very high level office. And you find in Cameroon, it follows the same way, a very high office, the prime minister's office. But in Uganda, as I had mentioned earlier, you can see those signatures. They come from all those health, agriculture, lifestyle, environment, and tourism. And then you see, I think in, uh, in Nigeria, again, is also a bit elevated. And now the Nigerian CDC, which is a very, very strong kind of African organization, comes in. So we're asking ourselves that we need to have these offices elevated to much higher uh, levels in government. And this is the story of Kenya. So when we are looking at where the Zoonotic Disease Unit is, it looks like it's somewhere down there. It's very functional. But then our dream actually is to see the Zoonotic Disease Unit move and be a directorate in the office of the president that gives us more muscle. It gives us more power actually to allocate funding as we move forward. And this can be replicated actually at the county level. And I like using this slide for Rwanda. And the question is, it's the only country actually in this region that has a one health policy. And how have they done it? I think they have had the political will. If you have the political will and you can summon actually the expertise to bring together actually on an integrated way of implementing this. So as they have moved forward actually in March, 2021 to have their first uh, One Health policy launched, they had previously had the strategic plan that was revised ending 20, uh, 2026. And it's possible even as we move forward as, the, as Kenya probably as a case study to move now from what we have as a strategic plan and think on having a very small document that we are going actually to present to policymakers to make decisions on what to prioritize and what to fund as a country. So um, we collaborate in a lot of work. And, and as I said, principally Horn is what I've been working with the project for Horn for a very long time now. We are coming almost to, to the fusion at the end. And uh, work with Eric Fav at the University of Liverpool and uh, advising FAO and these matters. And just to thank the organizers of this conference as Oreca, I think uh, being a very new, it's not really an old organization, but it has been able to pull up this kind of a conference. I think that actually gives us an opportunity to share what is going on in the region and probably to hope in future that we're going to have all these things being done in person. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you about this. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nanyingi. I think I don't want to belabor and uh, say anything more because most of that discussion will be carried into the next session. But I just want to echo the comments of the Kuala County Veterinary Officer, Dr. Umlai, that says this is light. This, this lights a spotlight in the tunnel. I'm not sure which tunnel he's talking about, but maybe yeah, you, you can get it, that it's, uh, it's be the beginning of trying to get animal uh, one health into a sort of uh, structured uh, sort of uh, delivery. And there's a lot of uh, good uh, reviews coming from the charts 
that shows that uh, people are really tracking this. And so without much ado, I'd like to welcome Lian uh, to then make the next uh, recap. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victor, and thank you, Mark. Um, it's a difficult uh, act to follow there. But I'd really like to um, firstly thank everyone who's remained online. We've still got um, some exciting, uh, an exciting session to close. Um, and I'd just like to spend a few minutes recapping over the last few days. So we've spent the best part of three days on a journey through the One Health landscape in Kenya. And during that time, we've so far welcomed um, over 1,300 unique online participants into our event, um, which is really exciting. And we hope that, this, that everyone's found this a great opportunity to get to know more about One Health in general and within the Kenyan context specifically. So we embarked upon this journey to um, both showcase what was going on um, in the country and also to understand how we could improve our practice. And I think we can be quite confident that we have succeeded on those, on those two objectives. We um, really are a bit more clear, not that the journey has ended, but we're more clear on our destination and what are the next milestones that we have to, have to hit. So in day one, we got um, a flavor of the many and varied One Health activities going on, um, specifically in research. And we were able to identify through those some best practice. This was really strongly drawn out as the ability to work in multidisciplinary teams, to draw, draw in new disciplines who have previously been um, maybe underrepresented in the One Health space and ensuring community engagement throughout the research process. We were reminded of the importance of undertaking world leading cutting edge research. And this, you know, I think it was, it's good to reflect. We were very privileged to be joined for a keynote by the Royal Society Africa Prize winner, Professor George Werimwe. He has built on his veterinary background in the field of vaccinology and uses the One Health, One Medicine approach to work on multi-species vaccines for RVF. The high degree of scientific um, rigor and endeavor that he brings to this is a really clear indication of the need for us to maintain our disciplinary depth we're not talking about producing One Health generalists here. We're talking about producing specialists who are able to reach out and cross boundaries and talk to each other. Um, this came, that was, uh, a, 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 sorry, that uh, was a theme that was echoed again and again. And so we saw from our audience participation on Menti, people see the defining feature of One Health as being collaborative, being transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, integrative. This came up in our speakers from our audience and was reflected in many sessions. So our panel yesterday on education really sort of spoke to this clearly. So they gave some examples of different um, programs which are teaching people to be able to work in this multidisciplinary um, way. Our colleague Margaret uh, Karembu from ISA talked about the need for us to learn each other's language, to have a One Health glossary to allow us to collaborate better. And it was, came up very clearly that the soft, so-called soft skills of communication are actually a One Health core competency. So talking of core competencies, it was really fabulous to hear from our gender specialist yesterday. And I think everyone will agree that Professor Helen Amagoni was really inspirational in the way she talked us through the need to acknowledge, address, and um, transform the inequities we see around us. And her, talk, her keynote was followed up by two really clear examples of how gender was brought practically into One Health research using a food safety and an RBF example. So I think we can take from this some really great ideas about how we incorporate that going forward. So from the opening remarks of uh, Ilri DG, uh, Director General Jimmy Smith onwards, another reoccurring theme was the lack of appropriate resource to One Health. Um, this is a real, a very real challenge and Mark Nanyungi has just alluded to it as well. And we hope that we'll come back to that in our policy session later this afternoon. But it speaks, a, also to the comment that was made by Professor Dele yesterday. He remarked that we need to find new ways of rewarding collaborative work. So we understand how to reward sort of maybe the 
faster pace of work that happens when you're working in one discipline, but acknowledging that building collaborations, building networks of trusting individuals takes longer. We need our funding cycle to acknowledge that length of process. Um, and it was nice to see yesterday again, the, the African proverb, proverb, go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that's a guiding principle. And we need to make sure that our funders acknowledge that. Um, the importance of this communication and collaboration was reflected again today in our um, presentation. So we had um, presentations that talk to the need to communicate with um, uh, communities. So that was brought up in the control of brucellosis and rabies. And we've also seen today a great example of one health in practice at the county level with our veterinary and our public health colleagues working together on a foodborne disease outbreak. We're really happy, again, I'm gonna allude to Mark Nanyingi, to have him here today to give us that overview of the, of the policy landscape here. And he also brought in some really exciting messages about bringing in new disciplines into the zoonotic disease unit and the county one health units in Kenya. Um, and it was great to look at the Ugandan example about how many disciplines have really been brought in there for the one health platform. Um, we also, I also noted, Mark, that you spoke to the importance of needing those subject matter experts to be guiding. Again, reflecting that need for us to retain the depth in what we do whilst we build our bridges. Um, and our audience have told us consistently that they are on a One Health journey with us and they want to become better One Health practitioners. I think we've seen consistently through the comments, the conversations and the chat, a lot of passion, a lot of um, persistence and a desire to do, to do better. So I really hope that the last few days have given everybody the energy and the inspiration to take these messages forward into their work. And um, I certainly will be um, hoping to do better in, in One Health from now on. So I think for, for at that point, it's now um, for me to pass to our Director General of ILRI, um, Dr. Jimmy Smith, for some um, remarks and reflections on the conference. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leanne. Colleagues here and online. It sounds like the job is done. And the light in the tunnel is not a train, but really enlightenment. From Leanne's summary, I unfortunately couldn't be here the whole time, or most of the time I wasn't. But from Leanne's summary, it seems like participation was good. The learning was extensive. The diagnosis was sound. And the understanding of what we need to do going forward is very clear. From the CG standpoint, of course, ERECA would continue to be an important part of how we take this forward. But ERECA is not a government. It's a facilitator. It's a supporter. The real action is how do we, as CG, support governments to do all the things that our colleague from FAO just spoke about. And in Leanne's notes, I was very pleased to see that you said that the focus on One Health must be on proactive prevention and preparedness plans developed and tested. I think this is the holy grail Proactive prevention and preparedness. Song simple, but this is really loaded. Prevention would mean early detection, for example, or even finding things before they come to light. Now, most of us know how to investigate, looking for things that we know exist. But many of the emerging diseases we have not seen before. So how are we going to be able, 
using our great scientific expertise from the world over to be able to detect, detect things before they actually become a problem. That's part of the prevention. Prevention also means widespread surveillance that you can detect things early. As I discussed on the first day, the cost of control is strongly correlated with time. The more time, the higher the cost to control. So early prevention is of course important. And of course, this big challenge here of preparedness, preparedness, this for HPAI, each country had to prepare a preparedness plan. And so we need this sort of thing at, at all levels. But note the, from our colleague at FAO who just presented, a notice call to elevate where one health sits in the government's architecture. To put as high as in the prime minister president's office. Well, that was almost what had to happen for HPAI preparedness plan because no ministry had the authority to commandeer the others. The only place you can commandeer all the ministries is at the supra ministry level, which is the president's or prime minister's office. But I don't know if the prime minister president has sufficient time <laughs> to deal with matters like these. So we need certainly the authority, but somehow we need to also, I think, develop a, an approach to One Health, which changes the in institutional perspective from when there's a problem, each ministry says, what do you want from me? So we contribute in relation to what we think is needed rather than how can I tackle this problem? So not just what my ministry do, tell me what I'm doing and get on with it and get out, but what is it needs to be done? And I think if we bring that sort of new thinking and combine that with changes in the institutional architecture will go far. So I'm here to say that from a CG standpoint, this is really urgent and important, but the CG is not a government, the CG support governments, and that's what we aim to do. I have spoken almost entirely and a good bit of the discussions I listened to had a slant of from a pandemic standpoint, zoonotic disease with pandemic potential. And I can understand why that has been the focus. It is strategic, of course, but we should not forget that we must deal with also the endemic diseases that places a heavy burden on the farmers we are supposed to be supporting. And of course, uh, consumers as well through uh, food safety and so on. But it doesn't sell endemic diseases, going to donors asking money for endemic diseases doesn't sell very well. What sells is pandemic. So our, our approach needs to be selling pandemic. And if you get funding for pandemic diseases, you certainly also have funding for endemic diseases. So a bit of strategy as to how we go about this. I want to thank all of you, my colleagues at ILRI and all our partners who facilitated this. And to say that as CGIR, we are committed to this. We will seek to get support for it. Uh, we will work with all of you to make this a mainstream effort but we must commit ourselves to what you said already, that we must have a focus on proactive prevention and preparedness. 
we must contribute something that is usable, that governments can implement. Just analyzing the problems and talking about the problems doesn't very help, doesn't help governments. So let's make sure we do what you said here you do. And I take the promise as a serious one that it will not be just us talking to ourselves, that you have identified some new skills which need to be brought in, public health, uh, city planners and others. But let's get also the medics in and the environmentalists in and so on. So I hope that with this diagnosis and potential treatment that you've offered, we have a way forward that we can implement in an actionable way that is of real benefit to the people who can use it. So thank you for these contributions. It has certainly will set us an ORECA and the CG on a clearer path. And we look forward to continuing to work in this area and to keep this forefront. Hopefully, and I would look to our colleagues here to ensure that this is not a, a conference and then we write the proceedings and we put them away. This is a conference which will help us to be more forceful to uh, mainstream One Health in, in not only the CG, but in the countries in which we work. So thank you very much. I look forward to learning from Bernard and Leanne and the rest of the team here about what concrete we must do and can do to take this forward. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot, Jimmy. Thanks a lot, Leanne. I think we are coming close to the end of our conference, but we still have an important session, which uh, Martin uh, will lead. So I would like to welcome you, Martin, to come and of course, introduce yourself, but also introduce the panel so that we can start uh, that session. So over to you, uh, Martin. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Bernard. I hope that cutting racer by the center director did not signify that we are winding up. <laughs> it was just a cutting racer for the closing ceremony, which is coming up shortly. But we also do acknowledge that uh, being the last uh, session for the last day of the conference, the energy could be low. But we still have in store for you a very exciting uh, uh, panel discussion to do here. Uh, you will recall that uh, in the last three days, we have consumed a lot of material uh, relating to scientific uh, outputs from a number of uh, experts, uh, researchers, and uh, One Health uh, practitioners. And I think that uh, we have uh, lost count on the number of times that the word policy was uh, actually mentioned in the as many presentations that we had. And to wrap up this, I would like to now transition you to uh, this last session that now focuses on uh, the topic of how One Health research can be translated into policy and practice in Kenya. But of course, not only in Kenya, because from the presentations that you have heard on the floor, uh, there is a lot of lessons and uh, examples that have been drawn from a number of countries in the region. Now, the planning committee, while thinking about how best to deal with this session, uh, did identify uh, experts and specialists from institutions that we believed are critical in the promotion of the One Health agenda in Kenya and in the region, and invited uh, the director of veterinary services from Kenya the Director General of the Ministry of Health from Kenya, the Director General of uh, uh, NEMA, the National Environmental uh, Management Authority, and uh, also a representative from uh, NGO uh, CCM, uh, Medical Collaboration Committee of Italy, and also a representative from FAO. So in uh, a very quick way, I would like to introduce the panelists uh, I do recognize we have lost quite some time, so I'll be brief with their introductions. But in the panel, we shall have Dr. Harris Oyas. Dr. Harris Oyas today represents the DVS Kenya. Uh, he is a holder of uh, the Bachelor of Veterinary Medicine from the University of Nairobi, a Master's uh, of Science from the University of London. He is currently working at the Ministry of Agriculture, Livestock, Fisheries, and Cooperatives, the Directorate of Veterinary Services in the capacity of the National Veterinary Epidemiologist. 
He's a senior deputy director of veterinary services, and he heads the disease surveillance vector regulatory and zoological services division. He has over 30 years of experience working in the public sector, and as the national epidemiologist, he has spearheaded the development and rollout of various disease control strategies, including uh, rabies, anthrax, brucellosis, foot and mouth disease, PPR. Uh, he has also been instrumental in the, the development of contingency plans for Rift Valley fever and the highly pathogenic avian influenza. Mm -hmm. He has participated in the development of national One Health strategy and has been at the forefront uh, of capacity building of country veterinary uh, services in preparedness and the response to outbreaks of transboundary animal diseases. Uh, Dr. Yasi has also been instrumental in the development of several cross-border memorandum of understanding with the neighboring countries to guide the harmonization of surveillance and control of activities of TADS at the border interface with our neighbors. He's a member of the East African Regional Epidemiology Network and the National Focal Point for PPR Disease Eradication Process in Kenya. Uh, welcome to the panel, Dr. Oyasi. Uh, next, uh, we have Dr. John Mumo. Dr. John Mumo uh, is here today to represent the Director General of NEMA, uh, Kenya. He is an environmental chemist working for the National Environment Management Authority, NEMA in Kenya, as a principal compliance and enforcement officer. In this capacity, he is the head of the Environment Laboratory in, in Environmental Management and Research, Compliance Infections, Enforcement, Environmental Monitoring, and Policy Formulation and Development of Environmental Regulations. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Philip Ngere. Dr. Ngere today represents the Director General in the Ministry of Health, uh, Kenya. He's a public health practitioner with interest in epidemiology. Currently, he is the National Coordinator, Events-Based Surveillance and Manager, Public Health Emergency Operations Center, Ministry of Health. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, sorry, uh, Odiambo Anthony from CCM. Odiambo Anthony is a public health and uh, health system management professional with over 12 uh, years of experience in the uh, human health uh, sector. In the last four years, he has uh, worked implementing a One Health project uh, in low limited resource context and uh, in Marsabit uh, North Hor in Kenya. And currently, he's also leading the implementation of uh, the Iril Red uh, Hill project. Uh, Odiambo also has experience in uh, formulating One Health programs, planning, implementation, and ensuring their alignment with existing strategic plans, policies, and procedures within the relevant departments. Lastly, but not least, we have Dr. Mark Nanyingi, whose uh, introduction I will not be labor because he was already introduced and is privileged once again to join the panelists in this uh, discussion. Uh, to the panelists, welcome on board, and I would like to clarify for you that uh, while I do know some of you had presentations already prepared, we have tweaked a bit with the format of presentation, and what we are going to do is to engage in a panel discussion where we shall be asking to you specific uh, questions severally and individually uh, to discuss uh, as a general overview. Uh, so if you had any presentations, they can only help you for reference to uh, have a quick overview on the points of discussions that uh, we shall uh, raise with you. The participants are encouraged to engage with you uh, in the chat box, uh, dropping in uh, uh, questions if they are. So with that introduction now, uh, let me just go now straight to the issue. Uh, and my first question will be directed to Dr. Oyasi. Dr. Philip Ngere and Dr. Mumo, specifically in your capacities as custodians of policies and the regulatory frameworks in the implementation of One Health in your respective dockets in the national government. And the question is, what do you see as major impediments to the effective implementation of the existing policies? We have already heard that as many policies do exist. Uh, so let's start with Dr. Oyasi, and uh, please, in your presentation, be very focused and uh, spend as uh, much a little time as you can uh, so that we can catch up. Dr. Oyasi. Uh, thank you. Um, our facilitator, um, I'll try to answer the question in as short uh, time as you have uh, indicated. My, from my point of view, 
the major imped impediments with our current policies has been the ownership and the, uh, the fact that a lot of the stakeholders who should be playing a key role in um, carrying out these uh, uh, policies at all the levels of uh, implementation uh, may not be either familiar with the policy or uh, may lack the resources to, to conduct uh, these. Because uh, as we all know, policies are uh, just a set of guidelines that uh, uh, help us um, to move forward and uh, achieve certain objectives that we have spelled out in the end. So ownership is very key, and this calls for a lot of uh, co collaboration and uh, dealing with the various stakeholders so that they, they, they see at what point does the policy affect them and uh, what is their role in carrying it out. So we need to start with them while at the development stage while we're developing these uh, uh, policies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yassi. We do underline uh, uh, ownership and uh, a lack of uh, dissemination of the existing policies to the main stakeholders as a key impediment from your perspective. Uh, Dr. Philip Ngere, uh, um, kindly turn on your video. And uh, while doing so, could I ask Dr. Mumo, in your perspective, what could you uh, suggest are the major impediments to the effective implementation of the existing policies? Okay, good afternoon, and uh, thank you. I hope I can be heard well. I'll be straight to the point. Um, one is actually, we have a, actually a, a poor link between research and policy. For example, uh, you know, I've been following these uh, presentations uh, since uh, Monday up to today. Much of it is research, 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 but you find that uh, there is no working relation between the, um, you know, the researchers and the policymakers. Such that now, when we have uh, these recommendations that are coming out of these research outputs, you know, they look like high-ended um, subject or scientific um, material that cannot be, you know, consumed by policy by by policymakers. So this one needs to be worked. For example, the, like the strategy which has just been uh, launched here, the ILRI strategy, you know. There was very little information about um, on, in, on uh, environment. What I could just relate on environment was uh, only climate, and uh, you know, so that link should actually be enhanced. I, I don't. I need to. I don't need to overemphasize the issue of the resources, as um, you know, Harry or yes has mentioned that. Uh, for example, in the in the environmental sector, looking at even what uh, uh, Dr. Mark Nyinge um, presented, you find that. Uh, very little focus has really been put on uh, environmental, uh, uh, you know, and uh, I think uh, this is uh, because of maybe, you know, a poor understanding or maybe there was a, when the, the conceptual framework, when uh, this one health was being crafted, was not actually, uh, you know, environment was not really understood as to whether it's an institution or whether it's a repository or uh, a sink of these um, anti, you know, microbials, you know, yeah, so, uh, that has to come out clearly about, uh, and then the aspect of uh, this silo mentality, you, we have, um, you know, sectors within the One Health, um, you know, just working alone and uh, coming up with, uh, you know, findings, you know, uh, we need to get an integrated approach. For example, we have the Environmental Management and Coordination Act, which actually promotes um, coordination of these institutions that need to come to work together towards this common end. But, um, you know, the challenge comes in is like uh, when, uh, you know, like if I may say, following the discussions we've had uh, since Monday, you know, much of it has been on veterinary, veterinary medicine, curative, but very little on the preventive. So we really need to improve on that uh, uh, significantly. And, and lastly, but not least, uh, you know, the, the language, and we need to find a way of how to communicate this language. When you talk about One Health, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, to a layman, you may actually be wondering what are you talking about One Health? And then when you talk about One Health, you wonder, is it One Health? And then, of course, when you start talking about uh, the components within One Health animals, of course, and then you bring the other jargon, uh, antimicrobial resistance, you know, we need to find, uh, yeah, a language that uh, 
who can be able to communicate. We need to get communication and information, you know, uh, specialists who can be able to package this information in a, such a, uh, you know, language that can be understood by the local person and the, uh, you know, the policy makers. But when it comes to crafting regulations, guidelines and uh, policies, it's actually something that's uh, not uh, typical for them to work on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mumo. I think you reflect on very salient points there. First of all, it's about uh, linkages between the researchers and the policy makers. I think it's not lost on us on the question of resources, resource allocation, appropriations. And this could be speaking to the observation made by Dr. Nanyingi on the placement of the National One Health platforms within the relevant line ministries, perhaps for better decision making on the resource allocation. We take note of the issue of coordination of institutions that are primarily responsible to promote or push the One Health agenda. And you have spoken to the impediment on the issue of communication a topic which was very well covered yesterday in a presentation and communication on One Health or science. And uh, that's quite well noted. Dr. Philip, your turn, please. Thank you. Thank you, Bwana uh, moderator. Uh, good afternoon, fellow panelists uh, um, uh, present and the presenters and participants, uh, both physically present and online like me. Um, at my personal level, uh, I think I've learned a lot. A few moments I've been able to join the conference as we strive to build a case for a more proactive, deliberate, and structured way of undertaking One Health activities. Uh, back to the question. Uh, I, I think uh, quite a number of uh, impediments exist in as far as, uh, uh, you know, uh, utilization of these policies that we talk about uh, is concerned. One of them, uh, I think uh, we, we normally have inadequate involvement of, um, you know, the policy level actors in terms of not just endorsement, endorsement and development of these uh, policies, but in terms of uh, uh, the real meaning and understanding of these policies that we develop. I guess uh, we need to think through how we can undertake, uh, you know, serious advocacy uh, through probably policy briefs, highlighting, uh, uh, you know, the success stories behind or that needs to be driven by these policies. Uh, the other thing that uh, comes to mind comes to my mind is uh, inadequate, uh, you know, use of the research information. Some of these could be contained in these policy docu documents. We could be using some of these to actually develop the documents. However, um, as far as dissemination is concerned, uh, we need to be more, uh, uh, need to adopt a more structured way of the dissemination of this, uh, uh, in the information that are uh, used to guide the formulation and contained in these policies by, by, by targeting various um, uh, you know, groups of, uh, of, of, of people, uh, including the communities, you know, the program level, the policy level, and the peers. Like we sit here, we could be resonating well with the information that we are sharing here as peers, but um, uh, I'm not too sure if uh, we'll be able to package this information in a way that uh, uh, the communities are also able to benefit or appreciate the good information that we are sharing together. Uh, I, I, as much as a lot has been done in developing development of this one health uh, policy documents, I think we are still, uh, uh, we are still, uh, you know, Held, in, held back by our various sectoral silos. Uh, and I think deliberate efforts need to be done uh, so that um, uh, as we, as we uh, you know, adopt these documents, we need to reach out. We need to reach out to the co colleagues, the colleagues who are hands-on, need to reach out to, 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 to program officers and uh, uh, and to make sure that they're also on the same page 
as the technical people that wa are working on these documents. Um, we also need to think through how we can, uh, you know, uh, in, in mainstream One Health issues into our routine training programs so that uh, when these policies are developed, you know, the documents, we are able to uh, understand these documents and we resonate with them well. I want to concur with other panelists that uh, there's still a lot to be done about ownership and support. Uh, much is being done, but I think a lot more needs to be done so that um, uh, these documents that you're talking about uh, uh, are appreciated by all, all of us. These documents that you're talking about uh, gain support in terms of resources from not just the partners, uh, and, the, and, and, and and collaborate collaborating stakeholders, but also the mainstream um, uh, government agencies and ministries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Philip Ngere. I think that the participants do acknowledge that uh, there is quite some concurrence on the key impediments. There is concurrence on the issue of uh, poor or weak dissemination and uh, ownership. But I think you also bring out a very uh, significant point on uh, the feedback loop, that there is a lot of research generated from uh, uh, research work done at community levels that feed into the policy development processes and uh, which result in uh, policy instruments that are domiciled in your dockets. But how this gets then fed back to the communities seems to be the challenge from your perspective. And it then remains a question from you as custodians of policies uh, how or what mechanisms then can be developed to ensure that uh, a feedback mechanism is well anchored and integrated in the uh, One Health Agenda. All right. Now, uh, I would like to uh, transit to uh, ask specifically now to Anthony before I will come to Dr. Mark Nanyingi. Now, uh, Anthony uh, from CCM, as an NGO implementing One Health activities, what could you say are the major impediments in the implementation of One Health activities? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would want to thank the organizers for this uh, forum and also the participant. Uh, I think one of the impediment in terms of uh, policies that are existing, uh, I would say in my view that uh, we lack a common uh, policy, especially that bring, especially that supports the integrated uh, services. For instance, in our implementation process, we've been trying to implement uh, integrated One Health unit or integrated uh, One Health services. And in this kind of One Health services, we integrate both uh, animal and uh, human health services, including environmental health services. However, you find that different departments have different structure. For instance, uh, veterinary or animal health have different structure, public health has different structure. And if you bring all these veterinary health services and you bring human or public health services together without any framework that supports them, that will spell out how they'll be funded, that will spell out who will be exactly involved in this kind of service provision, it becomes a bit difficult. And uh, as we do it, as at the moment, we are doing it as a partner to the government, but supported by the donor funding. But we expect this kind of new model, because I would say this is a new model that we have introduced, is a new model of service provision that integrate uh, the both human, animal, and human health services. We had piloted it, and we have seen it working well, and now we are, we are going on with it in both Isiolo and, 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 and uh, Marsabit County. But the question is, beyond the project, how will the county government continue with this? So we see that if there is no a strong framework that will support this kind of new model of service provision, then we may have a, a, a problem. Uh, the other thing that I may allude to also is a contextualization of the policies. I think, or I feel that we really need a policy that consider or cover the whole Kenya. As you can see, uh, through the ZDU, we have, we've already prioritized different uh, zoonotic diseases. And even if you come to the public health, and different region, you'll find that they have different endemic diseases, both for animals and human. And different region, they have different uh, environmental needs. 
And uh, with this, if we have a robust kind of policy, if we don't have a robust kind of policy that will address every context, every part of Kenya with their different needs or different One Health need. And I think this is one of the things also that somehow impedes the implementation of the current or the existing policy. Also, we have seen, for instance, uh, from the previous uh, prevention, which we have seen Kenya has done a lot in the past decade in developing different a strategic plan that addresses different zoonotic diseases and addresses different, I mean, areas. But if we don't have, we, we are still, I feel that we are still lacking a common kind of policies that bring all this together. Because to me, One Health entails coordination and having everything implemented as, I mean, coordinated way. But if you don't have a good or a strong policy that support how all this can be packaged together and implemented together, then uh, to me, that's one thing that also impedes some of the uh, milestone that we are trying to, to make. Thank you. Thank you, and Tony. I think you underscore the issue of the need for a framework that facilitates the multidisciplinary integration or operationalizes the integration of uh, the multiple disciplines in one health uh, uh, implementation. I think you also speak to the contextual disparities. For example, if you are implementing in the drier, or can we say, asal parts of Kenya, vis-a-vis -vis other ecological zones, if there could be some uh, peculiarities that need a, a specific uh, policy or uh, regulatory framework specific to those regions. Uh, thank you uh, very much for those observations. I ask participants if you have any observations, questions, Please drop them in the chat box. I may have a chance to pick one or two to feed back to the panelists for uh, uh, further discussions. Now to Dr. Mark Nanyingi, uh, as a representative of uh, an international organization, of course you are affiliated to FAO and you've done a lot of work also uh, in this area and having been highly involved in the creation of uh, One Health policies in the region. And given the disparities you alluded to in the regional countries in terms of One Health policy efforts, what do you see as the main impediments? And uh, are these impediments reflected in other countries other than uh, what we speak to in Kenya? Uh, thank you very much, Martin. Um, I think the scenarios are not unique to a specific country. Our the governance and political structures across, uh, say, the Horn of Africa and to a far extent to the wider Sub Saharan Africa are similar. And um, the challenges that we we'll encounter probably in Nigeria would be uh, almost the same that we we'll encounter in Africa. And this has to do with convincing uh, the people who have the money, these are the politicians. So, to someone, political goodwill there'll be need actually for extending these collaborative efforts beyond borders. If you have a network of One Health uh, across the region being brought together by, for example, the Triapetite, and then there'll be lessons learned, there'll be best practices. For example, you can convince your government that this can be done because it has been done in your neighboring country. So I think the whole thing is having those policy documents in place that will be able actually to provide evidence for political will and commitment uh, from our respective governments. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Nanyingi. Uh, there is a question on the chat box. Do we have a One Health uh, regional uh, platform? A regional One Health platform? Dr. Nanyingi, if you may want to speak to that. Uh, yes, so we have both formal and we have also uh, both, I'll not call them formal as such, but probably social media kind of interactions. Now, in terms of uh, the East African community uh, based in Arusha, uh, it has a well-structured uh, kind of platform in pandemic preparedness that coordinates activities across the, the region. For example, in the East African region, uh, we have common simulation exercises at uh, the transboundary which are conducted between the Ministry of Livestock in Kenya and, and Tanzania and Uganda. So they, there's a high likelihood that we just need actually to strengthen these uh, platforms. And the Trapatite, uh, WHO 
OIE and, and now being joined by U, uh, UNEP, uh, it has actually spread this gospel across the region. Now, the informal ones which I was talking about is that we have networks created by individuals or universities. For example, we have the AFONET. This is a WhatsApp group that probably shares uh, real-time information on what is happening. It's led by leading scientists in Africa, both in the animal and, and, and public health uh, industry. So there's a need to have local level platforms that can cater for local needs. Let's say you can have your own county, actually having a county, you know, one health uh, uh, a, a kind of framework, and then you can have the national one, and this can actually, you know, snowball into regional efforts and even have probably online, you know, kind of platforms. So the way to go forward is just to break those barriers and actually embrace each other across the borders and actually try to preach this gospel of one health more widely. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that remark and for the answer on that. Now, uh, the other reflection I would like uh, the panelists to have uh, relates to the policy needs. This is not specific to any panelist. I would give you the leverage to tackle it at a, uh, on a voluntary basis. Are there major policy needs to bridge the gaps in the collaboration and coordination in the implementation of One Health Agenda in Africa? You will recall that uh, in as many presentations, there were calls for policies, policies uh, to fill certain gaps, to bridge certain gaps. Also in your presentations from the government uh, perspectives, you insist that there are a number of policies that already exist, but you also do acknowledge that more can be done. What are these major policy needs that we need to bridge the gaps in collaboration and uh, coordination uh, in implementation of One Health uh, Agenda in Africa? Dr. Yasi, if you may just have a sentence or two on this. Yes, um, given that the diseases that we are dealing with are uh, transboundary in nature, um, and also um, AMR is a problem that uh, does not respect uh, boundaries, it is important that we, we have in place policy needs on how the countries within at least the sub-Saharan countries, which have a lot of commonality with regard to uh, the diseases that uh, they have, uh, share information. We need to have a strong policy on this that uh, we should be able to pass on uh, information from one country to another uh, quickly, uh, because this again is, is part of our early warning system. Um, can we have a common database where we share data on zoonosis uh, across the region? Uh, th those are the kind of uh, uh, needs that would uh, enhance uh, collaboration within the countries. Uh, maybe the trainings uh, of our people, um, the curricula that uh, we, sh we should uh, be having in this region should also be uh, have something in common so that we are, we are actually uh, coming up with uh, uh, personnel who understand their uh, approach towards uh, One Health, the need to share across the, uh, the various uh, players in One Health, and uh, the, the advantages that uh, we, 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 as, we will be able to get if we have that uh, common approach. Thank okay. you. Okay, Imagine. thank you. Uh, Dr. Philip Ngere from the uh, medical uh, perspective, what could be your take? Thank you. I think first and foremost, um, this one health, um, implementation of One Health, you know, brings together uh, uh, different sectors. These different sectors uh, uh, are traditional, uh, you know, di different backgrounds, different culture, different ethics, and different documents guiding their activities. So whenever we are developing any policy, it is imperative that we make sure that uh, uh, the policies that we develop uh, you know, 
communicates or resonates well with whatever other document exists within this uh, guides practices within this other sec within the sectors involved. Uh, otherwise, uh, if this is not done, then I think um, uh, adopting uh, the, the, the policies that we develop for One Health might be difficult. Might be difficult at the the sectoral levels. Uh, like I alluded to in the initial uh, remarks, uh, uh, I concur with the Dr. Yats that um, we also need to find a way of um, you know, revising our traditional curriculum, curriculum so that um, uh, uh, we incorporate One Health issues into this curriculum and we develop policies where uh, trainings and activities can be jointly undertaken uh, 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 at, at that level, bringing together all these sectors. Because what we've seen is that um, at lower levels, we might not be advocating for much, but when you come at the, at the higher level, the technical level and, um, and uh, policy levels, then we have a lot of uh, activities that we are doing uh, to, to, to foster One Health initiatives. I think this needs to trickle down to, 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 to lower levels as well. Uh, so that um, this becomes part and parcel uh, of the entire chain. Thank you. Dr. Mumo, just not to leave you behind as a policymaker, uh, in just a sentence or two, uh, what could be your take on the policy needs before we transit? From the, I'll be based on environmental uh, issues uh, because, um, you know, this actually sector has actually really suffered um, uh, significantly, even from the presentation that we've had uh, for the last three days, I doubt whether there's even one that has even touched on environmental, uh, you know, but uh, I would want to make it very clear that, you know, there's quite a lot of metal leakages. For example, there are quite a number of tools that are used in environmental management. For example, the environmental impact assessment, environmental audit. We also have regulations that will, you know, help in the management of uh, uh, waste. Uh, you know, you're looking at uh, issues from um, uh, poultry, from uh, animal manure, you're looking at uh, large scale farming, you know, this kind of waste, you know, need uh, regul they need tools for their management. And uh, when we have pollution, for example, uh, there was pictures that actually shown uh, that show pigs that were actually swimming in um, sewage water. And now, you know, we look at aspect of water pollution. There are also regulations that actually touch on water, water quality. And uh, of course, we also look at uh, tools for, you know, uh, preventing environmental pollution. So, uh, there, there's quite a number, but there's quite a number of, of uh, aspects that uh, environmental uh, man management can offer because uh, the other aspect always focus on the curative and, um, and, and, the, and, and the problem aspect. But you know, when you look at the environmental aspect, this actually helps in actually the preventive aspect. Um, uh, you know, specifically, uh, we'd look at, you know, tools that are going to be used to strengthen the regulatory requirements and capacities for waste management. We are looking at water treatment and uh, water management. We need to look for a different way of how to deal with this. We need to come up with uh, effluent standards. Standard currently, our water quality standards are actually focusing on um, the chemical aspects. You look at issues about heavy metals, but there's nothing that there's very little about E. coli, the biological aspects that actually, you know, cause, uh, you know, these uh, zoonotic diseases. We also need to look at uh, how we, we are going to have uh, best available technologies that are going to meet uh, with these uh, uh, needs that are also coming. Uh, and also we need to, we need, we need to improve also uh, education that actually helps us to understand the aspect of environmental management in the concept of uh, One Health. So uh, there's education, there's policy. We need also to review our current regulations so that we are able to incorporate aspects of One Health, for example, you, I, I know most of us have been hearing about a uh, circular economy, but in this case, we can also, ha also have one health person integrating environmental management. But, you know, when you're talking about policy, this actually has to be done in, in an integrated manner, not only the environmental, you know, we need to come and sit together in one platform so that um, when we are making a policy change here, it does not become our backlog or it does not become a, an, an, an antagonism. It does not become a, an obstacle, you know, when it comes to the time of implementation so that we have a clash of mandates between uh, these various sectors. 
uh, we need to work on the research, uh, you know, research and development, and also, you know, we need to improve monitoring and the surveillance and uh, surveillance uh, surveillance system across, you know, not only on um, the animal health side, but also we look at, you know, you know what, the, uh, for example, you're talking about COVID. You know, nobody's actually wondering, nobody's even talking about uh, what effect uh, our waste which are cont contaminated by this virus is having on our treatment system, on our waste management system. You know, you're thinking about even the, you know, the pigs, we do farming on our sewage. Can we be returning this back to our system? So in a nutshell, we look at policy, regulatory, education, uh, uh, um, monitoring. So. I, I think uh, let me leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Terry. I think uh, the overviews from the three uh, policy experts does acknowledge that uh, there are policy gaps and that there are need for policy frameworks and regulations to be developed to fill these gaps. There is a call for a policy that uh, will facilitate and enable the establishment of common databases that uh, facilitate sharing of information. We hear of standardization of training, training curriculums and joint training programs. Uh, we hear of standards in the management of waste and uh, matters to do with coordination in terms of policy formulation, formulation and application to avoid uh, uh, a clash of uh, mandates in terms of uh, enforcement and, of course, matters of m and &E. Now, Dr. Nanyingi, uh, the three colleagues uh, are, are custodians of policy within the national government uh, departments. Do you think they have sufficient data to enable them formulate policies, or do you believe there are certain uh, uh, gaps in terms of the data that they need? And therefore, if there are some gaps, what kind of data do they need? And how do you think that this data should best be communicated? Uh, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, I think from my own short experience of uh, interacting with uh, mainly uh, the DVS and the MOH, that is through the platform of ZDU, uh, we have realized that there's tons of data available uh, from the routine work that is being done on surveillance. And the evidence of some of this data has come out in terms of very good publications that have come uh, from the support of the DVS and the MOH. Uh, key authorships coming from um, uh, technical experts at the ZDU uh, I think the way to go forward, and this has been proposed by uh, very many other research scientists in the country, we need to create channels for communication. We need to share data more robustly and openly. I think the issues of data privacy and utilization has been a very big issue. In a way of trying to give an example of having like the, D the DHSI2, which is uh, probably uh, the repository for the, the health surveillance data. We have seen proposals actually was trying to create relational databases that can speak to and communicate with the DHIS2. A very good example, and probably this will be uh, emphasized by, by Harry here, that we are looking at CABS, for example, the Kenya Animal uh, Surveillance uh, Platform that has been created and supported by institutions like WSU and CDC which actually helps to bring out most of the data that is being collected on zoonotic diseases. And groups of people who are analyzing this data and coming up with probably policy briefs or probably just evidence-based because for you to make a policy, you need actually to rely on this evidence that's being generated from research. So creating a bridge between uh, the ministries of health, livestock and bringing in the environmental aspect as Mumbo has said, and this will be supported by the subject matter experts probably who will be churning out this kind of data that will actually, the data-driven system of actually providing evidence for policy making. So I think that would be the way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nanyingi. I think uh, we take note that uh, large amounts of data is actually available. The impediment remains the channels of communication. And I think a call for open data access protocols, uh, repositories where data can be easily accessed, of course, we do acknowledge that research and policy development is works in progress, but uh, we need frameworks that facilitate sharing of information across disciplines to make more data relevant, data available to aid policy formulation. Now, uh, Anthony, as a, an NGO implementing One Health, 
How do you think uh, research work influence the implementation of One Health activities? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin. Uh, from where I sit, I think uh, research influence uh, a lot and uh, what we would expect also from a research team is a robust documentation of one health intervention, especially the lessons learned and uh, probably the good practices. And uh, this good practices should actually be also based on scientific uh, evidences because you know, we are trying most of the time we try new things and as we continue to implement also it is a learning process for us and as i say we are coming up with new models of uh, of, of service provision we still need to learn a lot and uh, from those that we learn we still need to document and, and and support this so basically what i say if we do that probably we'll be able to come up with some models that will be responsive to the needs, to the one health needs of different communities in, 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 in different areas or in different locations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that is a reflection on a robust uh, documentation in scientific parlors could be publications that then provides uh, access to information that you could need for uh, 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 programming uh, uh, efforts, which is evidence-based. Uh, thank you. Now, uh, let's transition. Uh, uh, we have just about two more items to wind up this. In the last three days, we have reflected very strongly on the need for uh, different disciplines to work together to implement uh, One Health. And I'm glad that in the panel here, we have representatives from the veterinary, medical, and environmental fraternities. Now, without following any specific order, what, what do you think are the main challenges you have experienced working with the colleagues from different ministries. And uh, we would love to hear how you have addressed these challenges. Dr. Yasi, let's start from, from, from uh, with you. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, we have uh, had uh, um, uh, quite a number of uh, instances where we needed to really bring together the One Health approach in addressing uh, challenges that were coming up. Uh, as uh, <clears throat> Dr. Nanyingi had pointed out, uh, the 2006, 2008 outbreak of Rift Valley fever was quite a challenge. And um, uh, during that period, the loss in uh, terms of human life was quite high. Um, down the road, about 10 years later, 2018, we get another outbreak, which even seems to be more widespread because uh, nearly 60% of the country was uh, reporting um, Rift Valley fever, either in animals or uh, humans. Uh, but the uh, toll uh, with regard to human life was much lower. And uh, of the two, I can say the difference was the way we approached it. The, the first one, we seem to be working in silos as has been referred to here within this forum. We, we were not working together. And um, the outbreak spread within the human population uh, much faster. But with the 2018 one, the early warning system that we had set up under One Health was very good. We were able to pick out the uh, outbreak very fast. Although in this case, it was actually in, um, in humans, but the same person who reported in humans was able to tell us that there's a problem in livestock. So that was uh, uh, somebody who was very well informed that you need to look around. It's not just, what you're seeing, the patient you're seeing in front of you, but what are the other factors, uh, environmental and otherwise, that are uh, causing this problem. So we were able to mobilize very fast uh, joint teams to carry out surveillance, to map out the areas and to conduct the response. It was very good. Um, uh, the challenges are there, uh, obviously, we, we had the advantage that through ZDU, we were able to link very fast. 
but this is not always the case, uh, either at the national level or at the county level. And um, we need to really come up, and here is where I think researchers can assist, to come up with uh, uh, systems that can easily uh, uh, bring us together as players, both in all the uh, concerned sectors, and uh, uh, mobilize the various resources in the different uh, 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 ministries or departments so that we work as a, 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 in a common, we have a common approach whenever, when we are doing not only surveillance, but also response uh, to the outbreaks. So these are the challenges. The other one that I'm seeing and has been mentioned is we need within the various ministries or directorates to recognize that uh, One Health should be supported just like any other activity within our mandates. And this is the creation of uh, dedicated uh, funding to, to the process, um, the deployment of the right human resources and the equipment that they need so that um, uh, it sometimes doesn't look like uh, it's just an, after, an afterthought. And uh, we, we have to run around to try and raise some of these when we are having a, a, a crisis. I do see that um, as we develop the structures more, that is uh, not only ZDU, um, right now we, we are trying to bring in environment very strongly there, but at a higher level, the National uh, Zoonotic Technical Working Group, which will have a wider uh, group of uh, membership, uh, uh, not only within the government, but private sector, uh, and uh, NGOs and partners that we should be able to break down those barriers and be able to mobilize the various uh, teams that we have under uh, ZDU that go out uh, whenever we need to address an emergency. We, we, we have the okay. laboratory team and the other teams. All these rely a lot on funding. And uh, if we have a common a platform where we can pull our resources. I think we will be much better. Thank you. Equipped. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mumo, in just a few sentences, I hope to wind up this in the next five minutes, but uh, what's your experience? Yeah, I think uh, much of it has been said by Harry, uh, but I would want to mention a few. Uh, uh, one of it is that uh, there's actually, I've actually noted that there's actually lack uh, lack of awareness on the tools that are available in the sector of environmental management that can actually contribute to one health uh, uh, strategies. You know, like I mentioned earlier, earlier, EIA, we also have environmental audits, water quality regulations, you know, those tools that can support uh, one health approach. And also there's also the challenge about, um, you know, uh, much of the policy tools and the plannings that are uh, were developed, you know, the environment has actually come later uh, has a lot of um, uh, contribution only on um, two sectors, that is animal and uh, health sector. So you find much of these tools, the policy uh, that were presented earlier by Dr. Mark Nanyingi, you know, really has very little about environmental management. So we are trying to work out on a catch-up mechanism. Uh, the other one is about the issue of um, you know, we the, the, the lack of um, a coordinated approach when it comes to implementing our activities. Uh, we know, you know, this uh, ad hoc uh, approach, you know, we meet once for an event and then after that we go. But uh, there, there's work which is working on, like we have a national um, steering committee on an antimicrobial resistance whereby, you know, you know, if, you know, we also have the Ministry of Health, you know, under One Health approach, they're actually reaching out to the environment sector, always informing us that, you know, this is actually what is happening. And uh, I'm looking forward to maybe to in future, this kind of ad hoc participation and working uh, in events we will actually be a thing of the past. And also, um, you know, also looking at the funding, much of the funding has actually been going to the health and, uh, and, the, and the veterinary sector and very little to uh, the environmental management such that when it comes to any activities to 
uh, to, to, to facilitate One Health, you know, we have to rely on uh, what we have. So I'll just leave it there. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's I don't want to take, paint a negative picture. We are actually working towards working together as, uh, you know, uh, to, to, you know, together on this on, on, on these aspects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Mark Nanyingi, just in a word or two, what do you see in your engagements with these uh, multiple disciplines as the main uh, challenge in terms of how they work together? I think the, the main challenge is sector specific priorities. Um, different sectors will prioritize their activities to be implemented based on how impactful this will be. For example, the Minister of Health and the Minister of Livestock, they might have their different strategic plans uh, that put into place those issues that they think are the most important in their sector. But uh, to heal this will be probably to have like the strategy that we, we are just about to launch, which actually uh, the developmental process involves all these sectors, including the environment, social studies, anthropology, so that we can actually cure all those gaps that arise due to having this tunnel vision in our specific sectors. Thank you. I think those have been quite uh, insightful remarks. It goes without saying that uh, in the One Health agenda, the environmental pillar seems to be the weak link. And uh, that goes without saying and could require uh, a more uh, targeted uh, focus uh, to make sure that there is better coordination and that uh, the environmental aspects are very well anchored in any policies or regulatory frameworks regarding One Health implementation plans. I think resource allocation is uh, another contentious issue here that uh, is problematic to the, to, the, to the disciplines that some departments or dockets get more attention in terms of resource allocation. And then of course, the traditional barriers that I think they are working to break so that there is more collaboration. Uh, the other one is about the establishment of common systems that uh, can facilitate the different teams from the different disciplines to work together, I think. Um, there was uh, somebody speaking to joint surveillance uh, systems, for example, the One Health platforms, the national steering committees on specific thematic One Health areas like the antimicrobial resistance could be good solutions to this situation. Now, uh, to bring this to a close now, I wanted to ask that uh, you reflect on uh, the engagements we have had with the participants, the audience over the last uh, three days, and we thank them for their patience, for their resilience. Uh, and just in a closing remark, uh, to ask you what you think this audience should uh, take home with them today uh, after the World Health Conference comes to an end. I think that uh, uh, with the protocol observed, let me just ask Dr. Oyase representing the DVS, what is that one thing that you would like the audience to take away as this conference comes to a close? Uh, I can only say that um, I would like that they appreciate the fact that the way forward is One Health. We need to put a lot of emphasis on it for us to tackle the challenges of zoonosis, AMR, food safety and other environmental issues. We need the One Health approach. We need a mind change. We don't work in cocoons, but to realize that we need each, each other to put forward our agenda and uh, to roll it out. That is the challenge uh, that I, I give the, the people who are in this forum that they go away with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Mumo representing uh, DG Nema. Yeah, uh, thank you once again uh, for attending this conference. Uh, my encourage, uh, what I would actually communicate, especially to the researchers is that um, there's quite a lot of uh, information that, that you have and data I've seen quite a number of you know, uh, recommendations. I would encourage you that when you're doing your recommendations, don't just limit it only to looking at the curative aspect, look at how you can also use it to uh, in, you know, enrich other sectors. Uh, for example, how can your tools be used to improve, you know, improve um, you know, uh, method development, uh, you know, monitoring, uh, you know, developing tools like uh, 
you know, uh, standards. You know, we like we like standards for estimating water uh, pollutants within the environment, and uh, you know, what are information that can be able to use policy. So, uh, try to you know cross over and you know translate your research finding to tools that can be used at the environment, animal, and health sector. Thank you. Thank you. That was Dr. Uh, Philip Ngere. So, Dr. Mumo, please come on. With your final closing remark. I already talked. So, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> you have just done it. All right. Next is Dr. Ngere. Thank you. Thank you, uh, the moderator. Uh, I, I think personally, uh, I'm happy in the sense that uh, as much as One Health is not. Uh, a new concept way back 400 BC, there's already indications of its relevance. Uh, it is now gaining prominence, um, I'll bet uh, late in the day, which is not a good thing, a, uh, which is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. Uh, and my, my plea, my plea to all of us in this conference is that um, we should not sit on the good information that we've been sharing with our peers. Uh, simply put, all of us who are in this conference are, are already converted and uh, sharing with them uh, as far as, you know, creating a sensitization and advocacy for One Health um, um, doesn't uh, add value, add much value as far as, uh, you know, converting everybody else to join the ship. So my, my advice is that, uh, or my plea would be that all of us try and make as much as possible, develop as much as possible advocacy briefs out of the presentations that we have and use this to reach out to those of us who still don't appreciate the value of One Health. Through doing so, then it means we'll make, um, uh, you know, we'll take this to a new level make more people appreciate and understand the importance of One Health uh, 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 initiatives. And, uh, and subsequently, you know, improve the, the uptake of this concept. Uh, and I think by doing so, then it means uh, we'll be uh, making more people understand, we'll be making it easier to, uh, you know, get resources and mobilize for resources. We'll be getting it, making it more, making it easier for uh, our colleagues to understand these documents, appreciate their value, and uh, you know, understand them as far as uh, when it comes to the, uh, you know, implementing uh, you know, the One Health uh, activities that we think through. Otherwise, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity. Thank you, thank you very much, representatives of the government uh, directorates. Kindly convey our utmost regards to the director generals that you have uh, very ably represented here. And together with your colleague panelists, uh, thank you very much for uh, honoring the invitations to come and participate in this uh, session. We have benefited immensely from your uh, great insights in your respective areas of expertise, and therefore a great contribution to the expected outcomes of this uh, conference. Uh, may we give them a, a round of applause? Now, panelists, by my uh, uh, privilege, you have the pleasure to vacate your uh, positions of panelists. And uh, I now have the pleasure to hand back over the program management to uh, Dr. Bennett. Over to you, Bennett. Thanks a lot, Dr. Barasa, Martin. Yeah, I think that was a very interesting session. We will not spend more than, let's say, at least five minutes to just to applaud and really recognize the contributions of all the people who have really contributed to the success of this conference. So my main um, role here would just be to give a vote of thanks. And I want to start with all the participants wherever you are, whether online or in the room, let's uh, applaud each other. Um, up to now, we have 200 and around 79 there. I think it's really a good demonstration of our um, interest and participation in this conference. The next group of 
uh, people I want to recognize are the presenters, those people who prepared papers. And it takes a lot of effort to really summarize that information and come and give and really contribute effectively to this uh, conference. So let's also applaud all the presenters who gave us that very good piece of information. The third group of people I want to recognize are the panelists. And we, in this afternoon, in this session, when we had representatives of the government, uh, NGOs, FAO, and many other people, I think it also demonstrates a very good interest on One Health and that uh, interest to partner and work with the rest of us. But in addition to really applauding you, we also have some um, presents, which Lian has prepared for you, especially the panelists who are here this afternoon. Um, I think Dr. Oyas is here. We can give you one, Dr. Nanyingi, but the rest will send them because some of us are online. So let's give Dr. Oyas one of them. Yeah. Do we have a picture or <laughs> no, maybe? <laughs> Dr. Nanyingi, you can come, as well as, um... oh, Thiambo, yes, yeah, sorry, yes, I forgot about you. I thought you were online. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with Dr. Thiambo then. Maybe, I hope it will, thanks a lot for coming. Thank you, thank you. Yes. You captured? All right. Thank you, thank you. So one more for Dr. Oyas. We didn't follow any order. <laughs> Just giving it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Oyas has been our greatest partner in many projects we do. So we thank you very much for that. Uh, Ilri graduate, former Ilri graduate fellow. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. We have one for uh, Dr. Ngere, and there was another panelist. I think there were five. Yes, we'll keep those ones, and then we'll send them to, yeah, as a person. So that's that for the panelists. Let's now have that slide on. Um, the organizing committee. I think that's another team that we really need to thank. It was in one of the slides which were rolling. Yes. I think the success of this conference has really been in the steering committee that was formulated to, 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 to prepare this. And you could see we had, as Lian said, we had up to around 1,000 people who logged in. And I think that's a testimony of how each of these people really came together and brought all sorts of uh, networks that they already have. So we have Martin Parasa from VSF. Thanks a lot. Um, do we want to do one by one or we just give them once? Yeah, all right. So, so uh, Martin, you have a present here? Yes. <laughs> Salome, I don't think we will send to her. The next is uh, Victor. Thanks a lot, Victor. And also he managed to help us get the CPD points for the KPB, which was also a game changer because we managed to bring all those people on board. The next one is um, Lian. But we were reserving a special mention for you because you are the chairperson <laughs> for the committee. And but for the present, say, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, Ari, I'll have a word for you later on. Maybe Penina is not here. We'll send to her. Uh, but thanks a lot, Penina, again for bringing the CDC um, uh, input. Patrick Muinde, also. Oh, yeah. All right. A former Ilri graduate fellow. Thanks a lot. 
Uh, Michael Victor is not here, we will send to him. Uh, Eric Fev is not also here, we will send to him. Samuel, I've seen Samuel, yeah, okay. <laughs> We had the pleasure of linking him into the Avrahun, yes. the entire network. Yes. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Thumbi. I think I saw Thumbi running away. Yeah, we'll send to him. Um, Wellington also is not here. Uh, we'll send to him. Uh, Nick Bohr. Although we have a special mention for you, but yeah, let's have a present for now. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, let me skip Geoffrey. Matthew Muturi is not here. We'll send to him and Athman um, Muatondo. Geoffrey and Nick, uh, let's give Geoffrey the present first. <laughs> I was keeping Geoffrey because I know he will sleep today. He has not been sleeping the rest of the last <laughs> how many days. And we're really very grateful for the input that you have had. He's our communication officer in Oreca. I think he has really put in a lot of effort to have this conference uh, running uh, this way. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. I think we've, oh, there's Robert. I skipped Robert, Robert Onsare. I think he left already, we'll send to him. Yeah. Oh, Hadija Chepkorir, yeah, she's from CDU. Yeah, we'll also send to, to her. That's really the organizing committee. But before I finish, I want to really recognize, uh, uh, first of all, Nick, all the effort that you put in, in all the mentees and all the letters that you sent and all the organization. But lastly, also for... Oh, yeah, the next slide where we have Nick, we have, um, yeah, Nick, we have Ross Kellen, Ross Manu, Geoffrey, Edwin, the IT team, yeah, they have been very, I think the conference has really run so smoothly because of your, 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 your support, and we really, really thank you for that. Um, Lian, I wanted to really thank you because this was your brainchild and we really see that as it has come out so nicely. And I think it has really been a very perfect conference and your efforts in making this come through. So special. So lastly, uh, I've been saying lastly for the last how many times, <laughs> you realized that the DG came here, he had another meeting but luckily we have um, our DDG, uh, Suponiso Moyo, is the deputy director of biosciences in charge of uh, genetics and, and feeds. So I have requested her to close uh, the conference officially and of course say hi to us. So welcome and do the final um, close conference. Uh, thank you so much, Bernard. Um, I'm told that I hold the key so I'll do exactly that. Uh, dear participants, uh, colleagues, distinguished delegates, those online and those who are here present, all protocols observed. It is indeed my pleasure this afternoon or this e early evening to uh, follow on where the Director General for ILRI left, just to again give some closing remarks and to Thank everyone for these rich three days. I think Bernard has done a great job in, in thanking each and every category. I just want to add on to say, I personally participated in some of these sessions for these last three days. It was a learning uh, sessions for me. And I was really uh, excited to see the engagement, the interaction, the exchange, even now the active engagement on the chat. So this is an indication that this has been very successful. And also to see um, senior officials engage and sit through. So I'm, I really enjoyed this last session and I'm glad I sat through it. 
Uh, so thank you again, everyone, for your participation and the organizing committee, the, uh, the people behind the scenes, our ICT, the connectivity. It's been long three days, so you can sleep well tonight and um, continue on this journey of engagement. Uh, so we really appreciate this opportunity and that Oreka and Ilri were able to host. So again, thank you, thank you so much. I just want to officially declare this Kenya One Health online conference closed. Again, thank you so much. Asante Sana.